Agent CZ aka Agent Cheshire, and yes I can pronounce that, is an extremely basic Polish platformer. Not basic because it's Polish, but because well, it just is. That said, despite it only being released in the language, you don't really need to read or understand anything in it, as it's as simple to play as it's to make a cake. And if you don't know how to make one, it's that simple. To make a cake, you take a cake and you make it. Period. I know, cringe, but this explanation seems funny to me somehow. Agent CZ is a gather all objects, time your jumps well and avoid obstacles kind of a game. And that's precisely what you'll be mainly doing, other than looking for something else to play that is. And it's also a perfect example of a late budget Amiga title that there's nothing wrong about per se, but also nothing spectacular about it either. It's a game that you may fire up and complete once and will never get back to it again. Does it mean that it's a bad one? Not necessarily, but it's definitely a title that's not worth tracking down if you don't already have it in your library. So you can take whatever I just said about it as you please. Akira. Yes, based on that Akira manga slash anime, it's one of the least popular and worst games on the Amiga. And that's not something I say lightly given how terrible Pro Soccer 2190 was. It's not as bad, but it's definitely in the same basket and represents the same incredibly low quality of school of game design. It's a side-scrolling action adventure that mixes up gameplay concepts quite heavily, never really reaching the potential original IP could be used for. Especially that the intro and credits make it up to be a pretty decent game. But as soon as you start the game up, oh my days, things turn 180 degrees near instantly. In the first few levels you're driving a bike through an obstacle-filled highway, avoiding holes, roadblocks and jumping off of ramps. Or ramps over holes, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, french fries, chips. If that's not enough, you're being actively attacked by mobs throwing bombs at you. I mean, it's been years since I saw Akira last, but I doubt there were any bomb throwings playing major role in the plot. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but keep in mind that I know how it ends, right? Anyway, after these driving sections, there are a few platforming levels which are no better really, and require only to kill anything that comes your way. Simple as that. Then there's one level where you fly in a weird thingy magic, but, and you probably guessed it already, Akira never gets better. It's as bad as the movie was good. And if devs would only focus on one or two gameplay modes and made them actually fun, the other two could be skipped and Akira on Amiga may have not been a bad cookie. After two average or worse than average games, it's finally good to cover something that's of a bit higher quality. And Alien World is just that. It's a shoot em up mixing horizontally and vertically scrolling levels. Interestingly enough, the screen itself does not scroll automatically, but only when you move, giving you a sense of more control and making the game feel less hectic than most other shooters. Other than flying and killing various bodies, you also have to quote unquote combat the gravity that actively pulls you downwards. Defeated enemies drop so called Zen, the currency of the game, or weapon power ups. Zen itself can be used in many of the shops spread across the game world to either buy extra health or upgrades for your weapons. While Alien World's graphics are definitely not bad, they're nothing memorable and it's in large part because the game was originally released on C64 and then later ported to Amiga and Atari ST. So while it's notably higher res and colors than the original, it's similarly unimpressive overall. It plays pretty good though, if you don't mind very 8-bit feeling design, so that's probably the most important thing that you should take out of everything I just said. American Gladiators is a multi-event sports game based on the TV show of the same title, and a pretty decent representation of the game show that I was never a fan of. It is composed out of 7 events that will test your strength, skill and speed, and they are well known to the fans of the show Assault, Human Cannonball, Atlasphere, Joust, Powerball and The Wall. And if you can count, and I'm still that all my viewers can, that's 6 and not 7. The 7th is The Eliminator which combines the elements of the first two seasons of the TV show into a single and demanding challenge. Unlike any other versions of the game, American Gladiators on the Amiga can be played by even up to 16 players, but even if you tackle it alone, you can expect to face 10 famous from the TV Gladiators. 5 male and 5 female. Ice, Gold, Lace, Blaze, Zap, Turbo, Nitro, Gemini, Thunder and Laser. And while I only ever saw a few episodes of it, I gotta say that these okay. names scream late 80s and early 90s like hardly anything else, and sound like catchy names for a bubblegum brand. Oh, and if by any chance the last event of Eliminator ends with a tie, it's run once more to find a definite winner. American Gladiators is actually quite fun, if you like odd little multi-event games. Axel's Magic Hammer is the name of a romance novel I definitely did not write in high school. And also a video game in which your in-game world girlfriend Lucy has been kidnapped by the evil dragon who's planning to feast on her. 
So, you, the teacher Axel, being the stand-up boyfriend that you are, grab your magical hammer and set on a mission to save her. Axel's magic hammer, that is very similar to Sega's Alex Kidd, takes you through 8 levels starting in Roman Village and ending in Dragon's Castle's dungeon. On the way you'll fight various bodies and avoid many different obstacles while picking up power-ups from blocks that you crush with your hammer. And these are quite varied and fun too, from a simple hammer throw all the way to the helmet allowing you to destroy blocks from below, Mario style. While Axel's magic hammer is not the toughest platformer out there, it's not one of the easiest either, and having an option to continue playing from where you died last rather than starting from the very first level is a huge help, and it's there. The option that is. Graphics and sounds are pretty good too, definitely not something to write home about, but pretty good. And it's overall a very decent platformer that sadly somehow was overlooked by the history. Hopefully this video will shed a little tiny itty bit light on it today. Baby Joe in Going Home is a humorous side-scrolling platformer where you play as the titular of Baby Joe and are trying to get home through four enemy field levels. As you go about it fighting bees, spiders, lawnmowers, yes, you heard that right, and any other body's life or otherwise, you get to collect various useful power-ups, like rattles that you can carry five of that can be used as a projectile to throw at the enemies, milk bottles that work as your de facto health points refill, extra lives and even nappies or super nappies for that matter too. Because yes, you consume cakes and your nappy will get bigger and darker and your movements become slower. You do the math what's the reason behind the change. So you will need to replace it via pickup. What happens with the used ones? Nobody knows, we can only assume that they're used to pile up on top of copies of this game, as other than having semi-decent graphics and pretty good music, there is nothing really great about Baby Joe. The scrolling is painful to say the least, the animation is stiff and the difficulty is unfair. On top of that, the levels are not overly creative and boringly designed, but that's just my opinion. And you may feel different about it, give it a go if you're up for a challenge, that is. You're Badlands Pete, a gun for hire, and you're on a mission, a quest, or just hire depends how you want to look at it. So you're sent to track down, recover and bring back the governor's daughters. And you do so in a mostly side-scrolling fashion, going through towns and titular Badlands killing any and all enemies on your way. And they can literally be anyone, as not only bandits are your enemies, and other may try to down you too. Even old ladies, which is odd but also adds to the unpredictability of gameplay. In all fairness, however, civilians will attack you in most cases only when you enter their houses uninvited. And you will, cause those houses is where you'll find additional bullets. Because believe it or not, despite what movies has shown us, they were not unlimited in the Wild West. Interestingly enough, since we're on the subject, shooting itself is a three-step process, where you have to draw your gun, aim and then shoot. And when you're done, you have to holster it to be able to move again. Fun. Some might say that Badlands Speed's gameplay is rather simple and repeatable, but I find it relaxing in an odd kinda go and dispose of everything way. Was it meant to be played like that? Hard to tell, but I can, so why shouldn't I? Better Dead Than Alien is 1988's classic shooter and a homage to even older classics like Galaxians, Galaga or even Centipede. That last in terms of how you control your craft. Because yes, you're flying in space and you have your own craft. And it's a good one. How lucky of you. But you also have to use it to beat 75 levels that the game is composed of. So your ship's at the bottom of the screen and can move in all four directions, shooting at aliens on top, arranged in various formations. This can obviously break formations at time charging at you, but it's not something you won't be able to handle, being the universal hero that you are. Other than the generic typical galaxian like fair of basic levels, there are also those that are akin to asteroids, and even boss fight here and there. Unlike the aforementioned classics though, Better Dead Than Alien gives you just one life and rewards more methodical, slower and careful playing, rather than all-out gangho approach. So it's best to slowly ground your way through hordes of aliens not missing any power-ups, rather than to maniacally push forward just to get to the end game screen. Despite your ship and enemies moving like early EGA games sprites did, so using just a couple of frames of animation each, Better Dead Than Alien is actually pretty fun, and if you like early arcade games, it's definitely one to try out. I'm pretty sure that everyone watching these videos of mine remembers Beverly Hills Cup with Eddie Murphy, right? It was a real fun comedy and one of the better movies of the early 80s. Was the game as good too, you may be wondering? Not to keep you on the edge of your seat, if you haven't played it, it's not. 
It's another of those wasted opportunities kind of game. A collection of four mini games that all feel as they are touch short of being decent if they were a bit more polished, but also all seem to lack it in mounts. Polish, that is. Not to mention choppy frame rate and slow gameplay. So yeah. Anyway, said mini games can either be played in story mode or practiced separately from the game's main menu. And there are shooting buddies in a warehouse in side scrolling action platformer fashion, chasing free trucks full of weapons and shooting them one by one, then getting into mansion in top down view and obviously shooting all enemies that come your way, and final stage is the first person shooter within the mansion that's not only boring but also pretty limited in movement and with just one enemy on the screen at time. Given that Beverly Hills Cup was released 6 years after the movie, I honestly expected much more. I didn't get it, but no one seemed to care back then, and no one seems to care now either. Black Hornet is a vertically scrolling shoot em up. Thanks for watching, I hope you liked the video. If you did, hit those like and. Nah, I'm just kidding, it's not over yet. That said, I'm curious how many of you actually did stop watching after what I just said. Coming back to our little shooter at hand, Black Hornet on the Amiga is as generic as they come. You encounter various different enemies on ground and the air, and as in all games in the genre, you have to destroy them all. Or try to, at the very least. Level graphics are pretty decent and varied, I gotta give it that, but they clash with sprites so often that at times it's hard to make out the exact sizes and location of all enemies in a particular attack wave. It's not game breaking by any means, just requires much more attention than your everyday shooter does. Black Hornet features quite a few different weapons too and if you have more than one at the time you can switch between them using spacebar, which is nice. One worth mentioning feature however and a counterpoint to my earlier statement of Black Hornet being generic is the fact that you can actually land on airfleets and the aircraft carriers whenever you see them. And when you do you'll be able to refuel and buy more weapons for points. But other than this single novelty my initial estimate stands. Black Hornet is generic. It's not bad, it's just not spectacular whatsoever. But if you're a fan of a genre, there's no reason to skip it if you get a chance to play it. If you're only Sunday shooter aficionado, best start with a better vertical shooter, like Banshee or Swift for instance. According to Moby Games, critics gave Black Lamp an average score of 76%. It was ranked 191st in terms of popularity on Atari ST list of games and 979th on Amigas. And I gotta be frank with you here, the Amigas scoring is closer to the truth, as Black Lamp is rather crap. Sure, there are easily hundreds of worse games out there, but should we really compare our obscure titles to the worst of the bunch? Or hope that they're hidden gems comparable to the best? Anyway, Black Lamp is an action platformer in which your main goal is to find and collect several colored lamps, the titular black one included, and bring them one by one to the first room you started the game in. Seems simple, but is anything but. As there are numerous different enemies walking and flying at the several rooms you traverse through and they have to be either avoided or shot. Your call. Though experience suggests it's always bad to rid of the scourge and not to avoid the confrontation with it. All the rooms are connected with each other by doors or ladders and you'll quickly grow used to traversing this as you'll be making nearly the same route all the freaking time. Graphics are not particularly great, but not awful either. And there are sounds. Yes, that's how I wanna end talking about sound design. Gameplay wise, nearly every other game in this video is better and Black Lamp is only featured here as I hardly ever heard anyone talking about it. So it's gotta be obscure, right? Blue Boy is not a great game. I should really not start with weaker choices, should I? Don't worry, most other games in the video will be better than the first two. Anyway, Blue Boy is an interesting and unusual title, as it's a sort of mix between Tower Defense and Missile Command with a very direct control scheme. You play as the teacher of Blue Boy, a 5 cents worth hero, and you're saving humans from aliens who try to abduct them. So you fly around the levels disposing of, of the alien scum and saving humans that are being abducted. There's a defender-like radar on the screen showing you where humans and aliens are at all times, so that you can stay on top of things and plan your routes most effectively. If an alien manages to capture human, you have to promptly get to them, eliminate said alien and save the person. Because keeping both your own and human lives are what's required for survival. Freed humans can be released from their cocoons in order to obtain various boons like extra weapons, smart bombs or additional lives. When all aliens are eradicated and there are still humans alive left on the level, the wave is considered complete. For every city that you defend there are two waves and then the boss fight with an alien mothership afterward. Just like I stated initially, Blue Boy is not great, but if you wanna try something unlike anything else, it's definitely one to keep an eye on. 
Bolom Rokojet or Bolom Roof Koyat, since I can actually pronounce that, is a side scrolling platformer. You play as an anteater and have to complete five increasingly difficult stages, avoiding various creatures and different obstacles. Touching any of these causes you to lose a life and returns you to the last checkpoint. That said, Bolom Roof Koyat is a very simple basic game where there's no weapons, no power ups or pickups, and all you have to do is to get to the end of each stage, timing your jumps properly and avoiding bodies carefully. Nothing more, nothing less. The graphics are nice and colorful, the animation is smooth and overall the game looks pretty decent. That said, it was also released in 1997, long after Amiga officially ceased to exist and it only ever came out in Polish. It's a platformer though and one that does not require learning any complicated mechanics or gameplay concepts, so not having any knowledge of the language should not really be a factor in deciding if you should play it or not. I feel that it's really decent, even if not necessarily for me, being as simple as it is design-wise and too little too late to have any real impact on Amiga's gaming scene. Borobudur is an Amiga exclusive and a mixed genre action-adventure game. On planet Borobudur, evil Dr. Ragnova is constructing a terrible device that once completed is said to be capable of destroying all technology and henceforth bring the planet back to the Dark Age. Since Batman's all the way back on Earth on my couch munching on something maniacally, you're the only hope to stop him. And that's more or less how Borbodur the Planet of Doom starts. Most of the game takes place in a side-scrolling platforming fashion where you have to defeat various enemies and seek and collect a number of hidden objects to open the exit to the next stage. As you go about it though, you'll gather weapon power-ups to combat the enemies and even do some simple environmental puzzling. Mainly Switch-related stuff, so don't expect to stretch that brain muscle of yours too much. You're not there to think after all, you're there to kill. Then there's quote-unquote driving slash flying where you pilot a spaceship in a third person behind the vehicle view. Same as in platforming levels, enemies will attack you and also same as in there, you'll have to bring their miserable lives to an abrupt end. Don't feel bad though, they're the bad guys. Finally, there's a proper puzzling stage in which you need to move blocks over the board in time limit to recreate a specific pattern. It's not overly challenging, but it's a nice change of pace. Borobudur is just something else, so if you enjoy these types of games, there are definitely worse ones out there, and it's worth at least a playthrough. Bratwurst is a German sausage. I really don't know what makes it different from any other sausage other than the name and where it comes from that is. Bratwurst is also Amiga exclusive 2 to 4 player versus shooter, clearly inspired and based upon area Gravity Force 2. And if you have someone, anyone to play classic games with, then it's one of the most fun games in this entire video, despite the simple looking primitive graphics. And since we're on them, unlike in Gravity Force, they're not sprites but vector based, which means that they can rotate, zoom in and out with relative ease. And they do, all throughout the gameplay. So when two, or four for that matter, of you are far away, the view is zoomed out, showing more of the game field and making it easier to chase each other and plan out attacks. And when you're all close by, the viewpoint is zoomed in so that the action is centered, more hectic, more blood pressure raising and also more fun. There's quite a few sci-fi and comics inspired ships to choose from and a whole plethora of special weapons for them other than the basic one. Bradwurst does not look great and the music is, well, something else, but it plays so good. Honestly, if you find at least one like-minded person willing to play with you, this game alone is a whole afternoon of fun for the two of you. Well, unless the other person is Manbat, who for whatever the reason keeps shouting that he's Batman every single time he kills me. It was funny the first three times, it's beyond annoying now. Commodore officially ceased to exist in the first half of 1990s. It was a sad time and most of us long believed that someone will buy their assets and resurrect the Amiga, so that it would come back stronger, better, faster and cooler than ever before. It never happened. But it also never stopped enthusiasts from releasing games for the system long after it was declared gone. Bubble Heroes, released in 2000, is one of those games. Simply put, it's a bastion of clone, but arguably at the very least as good, if not better than the original was. The idea behind the gameplay is that simple. You complete increasingly more demanding puzzle levels by shooting color bubbles from the bottom of the screen at the top, where there are more of these arranged in various patterns. If the one that's shot touches others of the same color and there's at least three of them in one chain, they pop and disappear. Bubble Heroes allows you to pick your character, either Brave Knight, Cat Girl or a Prince turned into a frog, and all of them have their own unique special powers helpful during gameplay. 
there's three game modes to choose from too. Story mode, in which your completion of level helps to free three names from evil gonzals grasped on planet Radia. Yeah, two of those names mean literally nothing to me. Then there's championship mode, in which you duel against characters from the game as AI opponents. And finally deathmatch, where you and a friend, or an enemy, can battle it out against each other in split-screen side-by-side action. Despite being released so late in Amiga's life, or long after it really, Bubble Heroes is amazing, and if you have it in your collection, it's a gem to behold and have a lot of fun with playing with friends. Brace yourself, Butcher Hill is not great. I mean, it's not as bad as Akira or Pro Soccer 2190, but you're not gonna play it more than once or twice either. Maybe three times if you're a bit of a masochist. I'm not. Butcher Hill is an arcade shooter taking place during US Vietnamese War. You lead a team of five soldiers towards the titular Butcher Hill through three distinctive sections of the game to save captured and held their POWs. In first stage, you steer a boat along the river, avoiding mines, oncoming fighter fire, and various other obstacles. If any of five soldiers survive, the game moves to the second stage, in which you're traversing the jungle seeking a path to the camp on the Butcher Hill. The jungle's filled with mines too, but that's nothing compared to the enemy forces attacking you and shooting on sight. You're no sludge though, and can handle yourself in a firefight, so as soon as you're done with them all and find your bearings, you head to the last area, the Butcher Hill camp itself. Here or there really, you have to destroy all huts and dispose of enemy soldiers that try to flee to bring back reinforcements. Would I recommend Butcher Hill to anyone? Not really, it looks and sounds meh, doesn't play too great and feels as if the devs just dropped the mic sometime during first weeks of development and then just decided to finish the game ASAP to jump onto other better projects. It's a play and forget type of a game. Earth. Fire. Wind. Water, heart, go planet, with your powers combined, I am Captain Planet. And with your powers combined, my viewers, I am Batman's landlord. Man Bat's landlord, he's a hero, will skyrocket cringe to top from zero. Sweet Jesus, mother of God, are we at over 9000 cringe yet? No? Well, give me time. Captain Planet and the Planeteers is based on children's cartoon show of the same name and it's an average action platformer. It's composed of six levels, where the first five you play as each of the Captain Planet's sidekicks, his Planeteers, completing various ecologically inspired missions, likes of saving the seals or fixing the ozone layer. The works. And in the final stage you get to play as the Cap himself. The graphics are not great, but most of the important characters from the cartoon are easily recognizable and their powers too. Apart maybe from the Hard Planeteer whose power in the game is just odd. Sadly, there's not much telegraphed in terms of what you'll have to do in each level, so you just have to work it out yourself every single time. Controls leave a lot to be desired too, as they're clunky AF, especially jumping, but if you make yourself play the game time after time again, you'll eventually get used to them and will be able to complete Captain Planet semi-comfortably. If you only manage to, that is, as it's not the easiest of titles out there. Still, Captain Planet is not a bad game at all, it's just perhaps not up to 1991 standard. Although incredibly long titled Captain Fizz meets the Blaster Trons was developed clearly with cooperative split screen two player gameplay in mind, you can actually try to enjoy it alone. But we'll need to use two joysticks in some of the stages to be able to complete the game. So if you have a choice, play it with a friend or even better your significant other. It's a top down action shooter with some simple environmental puzzle elements and it's not an easy game. Even if the goal of each level is surprisingly pretty simple to get to the end of it. Period. To do so, you'll have to destroy all enemies and all other destructible objects for the exit to open. It's easier said than done, however, as while early levels are pretty light, the latter ones are not. They are designed like a maze and chock full of either color-coded passages or one-way doors on top of hordes of enemies. So navigating them correctly and not missing anything is a key to success. Believe it or not, but Captain Fist has a story. Apparently you're on a spaceship that's out of control and heading straight towards the sun. And you, with someone else, are the only two who can save it. And it's a two-man job. So you need to go through 20 levels of the spaceship decks until you get to the main computer and deactivate it. I know, seems like a bit too overthought plot, but it is what it is. And the game is quite funny if you're not a loner. Carcharodon White Sharks is one of the most beautiful games on the Amiga, and a pretty decent while not outstanding horizontally scrolling shoot em up. While forementioned graphic can be stunning, with some backgrounds, enemy sprites and especially bosses being the obvious examples, the gameplay is rather bland. 
It's basically legions of enemies coming at you from all sides and they move so fast that you hardly ever get a chance to stop pressing fire button for your finger to recover. I'm not sophisticated when it comes to my shooters and I like them simple, other than the looks Galaga slash Warblade that is. So this is not a big issue for me. But if you expect novelty, complicated boss tactics and memorization, there are better games than this. What's most notable about Carchorodon though is its unique weapon system which allows for combining them together and given the choices in the game there's literally close to 37 million different possible combinations. To be honest, while it's obviously a lot, it doesn't really feel like it. So don't let the number fool you into thinking that this game is something else than it is. And what it is, is just a competent playing and awesome looking shooter, nothing more, nothing less. If you're a fan of a genre, you've played better, but definitely don't skip this one either. If you're not, give it a go, it's fun for a while. Evil Wizard Zandor, who has long grown tired with peaceful and just ruling of current king, Edel Red, has infiltrated King's castle and poisoned him. With the ruler gone, the Mad Wizard will be free to take over the kingdom and do what he pleases with it. Fortunately, the king is not a weakling, and while poisoned and slowly dying, he's not gone yet. Luckily, there is an antidote. Unluckily, however, it's in the care of a wizard himself. So you, being the ultimate ass kicker, badass and hero extraordinaire that you are, not to mention in-game king's son, decide to head to the wizard's castle and get the cure. Castle Warrior takes place over 6 levels and it's entirely viewed in third person perspective from behind the back of our hero. And it's a mixture of arcade hack and slash adventure game and more modern than non-existent genre of runner games that were popularized by the smartphone boom of mid 2000s. With an exception that your character does not run on his own, he walks. Each level is unique and pretty unusual as compared to what was usually released in the late 80s. So you'll swim in canoe, run and even fly. Same as in most games in the genre though, every level ends with a boss. They all require pattern memorization and repetition to beat, so yeah. Castle Warriors graphics are pretty good too, apparently using more than your usual on the Amiga 32 colors. I haven't counted them myself, but judging on a face value it does look impressive with nice and well mixed palettes and large sprites. The scrolling slash movement is a bit slow, but I suppose it's because Amiga had no hardware sprite scaling. All in all, Castle Warrior looks great and sounds interesting on paper or when it's spoken about, but believe it or not, it's not very fun. It feels clunky, very Dragon Slayer-like and it's not everyone's cup of tea. As prehistoric themed games go, Cavemania is terrible. It originated on ZX Spectrum before being ported to other systems. And while there's nothing wrong with Specky itself, this game on the Amiga is just not worth your time. It is obscure though, so here we are. Well, first of all, Cavemania is a side-scrolling platformer in which you need to collect three dinosaur eggs per level and bring them back to your cave one by one without breaking before you can move to the next stage. What's the point of that, you may wonder? No one knows, perhaps our little protagonist wants to make the biggest scrambled eggs or omelette, perhaps he's a collector, or perhaps the reason is something else. I don't care and I don't think that devs did either, as completing the game gives you a very unsatisfying congratulations screen. That's it. Why do I tell you about it rather than let you discover it on your own? Well, I'd like to spare you the pain and save you some time you could invest in something better than playing this game. Like scratching your ass, picking your nose or farting. Yep, all these are better use of your time and more fun. The controls are clunky to say the least, jumping especially, and since jumping is like half of what most platformers are about, you see the issue here already, right? Then there are also bugs, that may but don't have to, but may but not necessarily will, but may still pop up here and there in various forms, even game breaking, leaving you without projectiles in the level that requires you to have them to complete it for instance. Ugh. My take on Cave Mania is, don't play it unless you actually do have some kind of a mania. Like maniacal behavior syndrome. Don't look it up, trust me, it exists. But if you really want to try the game out, keep in mind that I did warn you about it. Charts of Wrath is odd. It really is. It's an action arcade fantasy adventure that mixes gameplay genres all throughout its seven levels. As per usual in fantasy themed games, villain of the game, in this particular case your arch rival Evil Baron, kidnapped and holds a beautiful princess Artina, your future queen. Because of course you're the prince and the future king of so-called Forgotten Kingdom. And it is. Forgotten that is. Cause prior to working on this video I've never heard of it. So you're you, the hero, and you play as, well, you, the prince, and you have to save the princess. No surprises here, right? Standard fantasy fair so far. But what's unusual about Chariots of Wrath are the aforementioned genre blends. 
There's five of them, in fact, within the game's seven levels. There's a first-person perspective, Operation Wolf-like section, where you shoot creatures invading the castle. Then there's Arcanoid slash Breakout-like level, and it plays exactly how you expect it to, with all the bricks breaking, ball, puddle at the bottom, the works. It's just stylized in a medieval fashion. There's the vertical scrolling shoot em up, bullet hell stage, but also fantasy themed and worse than the classic. Chariots of Wrath wouldn't have been released in 89 if it didn't contain at least a single platforming stage, with the usual side scrolling diamond collecting fair. And last but not least, there's also asteroids like level where you're in the middle of the screen destroying rocks coming from all sides. All those minigames alone are not great. They lack polish, substance and are heavily simplified versions of their respective progenitors. But as a collection under one title on a single disc, they're actually pretty fun to play as the game never gets a chance to get stale. If you enjoy genre mashups, this one's not to miss. Mega Twins, aka Cheeky Cheeky Boys, is a port from arcades and actually an excellent title on the Amiga. And it's a fantasy themed action platformer in vein of classic Wonder Boy in Monsterland. The peaceful land of Alren, I think we can all guess how this sentence ends, right? So said peaceful land has been invaded by the evil demon who sent a dragon that killed the king and released all kinds of nasty monsters onto the kingdom. The king had sons, however, twins to be precise and they're out for revenge and out to clear the land of all evil. And you take control of one of these, or you and a friend as Mega Twins can actually be played in simultaneous multiplayer. And if you get a chance, that's how you should experience it. Each of the brothers has different skills and strong suits. One is more skilled with a sword, which he's always wielding, while the other is gifted in magic. Both brothers collect coins as they go through the game killing monsters, and this can be spent in the shop to purchase extra life, more magic and better swords. There are three levels in the game, Earth, the Heavens and the Sea, and they can be tackled in any order. The first is a straight up platformer, the second sends you into the skies platforming between the clouds, and finally third takes place underwater. When all three are completed, you get to go to the monster castle to defeat the demon that's caused all this commotion. Mega Twins looks, sounds and plays great. Could it be better? Easily. As Amiga's version is just a port from Atari ST with all the limitations of that hardware. So 16 colors only, no music, jerky scrolling, small play area and slow movement. But, but despite all that, it's still a really fun title. Klystrom originated on C64, and there it was praised for its graphics and great music design. On Amiga it's, well, um, I mean, well, it's on the Amiga. There's nothing praiseworthy going for it though. Klystron is a sci-fi themed side the action arcade platformer where you control a bipedal robot similar to that in Psygnosis's Walker, and have to collect 8 machine parts within given time limit. Whenever a part is uncovered and picked up, a new transporter slash elevator location is unlocked and can be traversed to insert for the next one. While you're searching for this, a whole plethora of various enemies will attack you from both ground and flying, and you obviously have to dispose of them to be able to carry on. While the premise and presentation are not that bad, the game is seriously let down by clunky controls and uninspired gameplay. For starters, your robot keeps walking continuously. I mean, press left and he'll walk in that direction until you change it or stop him, despite any enemies or environmental dangers. It's uncomfortable, it's difficult to get used to, and never feels right, regardless how long you decide to waste on Klystrom. Then there's shooting and jumping. You can do either, but not both at the same time, which causes a whole range of other issues. Finally, simply put, it's not very fun. It could be, but somehow it's just tiring. I suppose it's all this that caused Klystron to never gain any real popularity and remain largely unknown. And you know what? Good. Colonial Conquest 2 is like Civilization but with few notable and gameplay changing differences. But same as Civ, it's a turn based 4x strategy, tackling, sustaining and progress of a human race. It does not take place on Earth however, but in space, where your typical for Sid Meier series world map is replaced by a space sector display with various planets placed on it randomly. You can settle on these and build colonies. This can focus on food, mining and production or be a mixture of. You can erect various buildings in your colonies from houses and power plants, through universities, all the way to spaceports and ground defenses. Because yes, believe it or not, in space you're not alone. There's also aggressive and expansive race of sentient machines that does what it can to make your life more difficult. Or to make sure that there's no life of yours to speak of. Or squeak of. Or hum of. Or beep of. I really don't know how these machines communicate. Fortunately, you can manufacture a whole set of various ships too, ranging from colony ships through fighters and large destroyers to huge battle stars. 
So if you carefully divide your attention between available options of building, research and warfare and micromanage your planets well, you should be fine in defending against the toasters. Keep in mind however that there can only be 28 buildings on each planet, so it's good to plan ahead rather than erect them willy-nilly without any real strategy in mind. Colonial Conquest 2 is excellent and if you're a fan of a genre and never heard of it, you're in for a fun next few days. I realized that by releasing those obscure Amiga games videos I often shed light on games that actually should remain forgotten. Games that deserve their status and place in the chasm of obscurity. And I feel that Corsarius may be one of these. It's a pirate team side-scrolling beat'em up that fails on basically all fronts. And it could be really fun as there's not many games in a genre set in Caribbean. Graphics are just awful, the characters are unimpressively designed and repeat often. Not to mention that their sprites seem to have just a few frames of animation making the whole fair feel even jerkier than it already does. Then there are hitboxes, which feel exactly like that. Like boxes. That go way beyond character's physique. So that when you hit or hit someone yourself, it feels as if all kicks and punches connect at a distance. It's odd looking, difficult to work around and unpleasant to play to say the least. Scrolling is jerky and any action you take, walking included, seems to have two free frames of animation at most. Overall, presentation wise, Corsarius is literally painful to witness in its low color glory. There's no music and sounds are sporadic and mismatched. For instance, your character's falling sound when he's hit or drops from height is what I could only describe as 8-bit explosion. And gameplay? Oh my days, ladies and gentlemen, there isn't any. You never feel as if the punches and kicks that you make would connect, regardless if they actually do or not. There's literally two, maybe three different moves and they're not very impressive given the limited frame budget. And Corsarius just feels like a punishment. To the point that I wanna take a second here to discourage anyone considering checking it out from doing so. Trust me, it's not worth it. Custodian is a side view action shooter and it's not an easy game. To the point that by the time you figure out what and how to do in it, you'll probably die a dozen times or so already. It can feel discouraging, and I get that, cause I'm one of those gamers who hates dying without clearly understanding why, and known to drop games if the first impressions of them are lackluster. But apparently, it's worth persevering with Custodian. Apparently. The game is composed out of three tombs, three levels if you will, and you will have to defend those tombs from energy draining parasites. You do so by collecting the pods that the aliens are using to drain and destroy them in a special annihilation chamber. Alien parasites are not very keen on that, so they attack you while you go about it. And obviously you have to defend yourself as best as you can. Cause if you're gone, the mission is a failure and all energy will be lost. There's up to 20 randomly placed pods in each stage, and if they're not removed in a timely manner, they grow and evolve becoming more and more difficult to get rid of. You start the game with 1000 credits that you can use to purchase weapons, and you get more of these, money not weapons, by killing aliens and collecting pods. Weapons are purchased at munition silos scattered around the tombs. And it's worth pointing out that it's good to have a couple of them at hand as different aliens are more or less sensitive to different kinds of weapons. When all pods are destroyed you have to face the final boss of each stage, the so-called Guardian, that is much more demanding than your usual alien parasite scam. Custodian is not bad per se, it's just misunderstood by most gamers, especially that it doesn't tell you much of its inner workings, so I can imagine people playing it with no weapons or ammo wondering what they do wrong rather than just going to the silo to resupply. So give it a go and let me know what you think about it. Cyberkick is a side view flip screen sci fi action platformer. Judging by the title, you probably expected lean, tall, and well built humanoid robots kicking ass. And what you've got is, well, um, how to put it nicely, not exactly that. See for yourself. The main character looks like an overweight Futurama's Bender wannabe, whose one and only attack move seems to be low shin kick. It looks as unimpressive as it's possible and not threatening in any way. More like a modern dance move rather than the deadly attack. Appearances are deceiving though, and not only said kick is threatening, I'd say it's the deadliest weapon in the whole game. Possibly no universe. I mean, just take a look at all those enemies dying from it, often in a pool of blood. But questionable animation slash graphical choices aside, the presentation itself is actually pretty good. There's nothing really I could complain about, the game is pleasant to look at, sounds are okay and the music is really good for what it is. Perhaps the video does not give it away, but the soundtrack is rather stealth. Cyberkick takes place on a renegade space base on Mars, where your goal is to collect all radioactive containers and carry them to the recycling stations. Wow, the team is kinda similar to the previous game we spoke about, isn't it? Collect stuff, carry it somewhere, dispose of it, rinse and repeat. Anyway, as you go about it, navigating hostile halls and corridors of the base, 
filled with traps, electric barriers, sharp blades and whole plethora of other environmental dangers, you'll also be attacked by various enemies, like alien creatures, drones, mechs, tanks and many more. And yes, you can beat them all with a funky best. Cyberkick is not the most ambitious, creative or even fun game to play on the Amiga, but it's one that you could very well complete once and not feel as if the time was wasted. It's hardly a recommendation, but let's keep in mind how bad those obscure games can be. Darkman is a side-view action-adventure platformer slash beat-em-up based on the movie of the same title and another sadly excellent example of botched attempt at the movie tying. Don't get me wrong though, it's not unplayable or one of the worst games on the Amiga, nowhere near that, it's just a wasted opportunity for something bigger and better. Darkman is composed out of six arcade stages, scenes if you will, roughly following the plot of the movie. Most of them are side view beat em up platformers with an emphasis on the beat em up, but there are some outliers that take an entirely different approach, like the helicopter level for instance, in which you fly over highway hanging from a chopper and avoiding traffic. It's a nice change of pace. From what I can tell, the beat em up bits have only two attacks, punch and a dance kick, very similar to the famous Michael Jackson dance move during which he pulls up his pants and kicks with one leg, you know, the attack from the Moonwalker on Sega Genesis. But Moonwalker was a much better game and we shouldn't really talk about it here. As long as you keep mashing button, attacking, no enemy will ever be able to come near you, which would be acceptable design in some early beat em ups on 8-bit systems, but in 1991 on Amiga it was a serious design flow that made the game bland and boring. Graphics are not great for the most part, with enemies looking as if they were using just a few sprites cycling different color palettes to represent different foes. Backgrounds are a mixed bag too, some being decent while others are just crap. I suppose the main character's animation is the only redeeming factor to the presentation as it's pretty good. Overall, Darkman is not great. It's not bad enough for me to discourage you from playing, but I don't see you completing it more than once on one of those lazy, slow and boring autumn afternoons. Day of the Viper is a first-person sci-fi arcade shooter. It's not FPS, as you would have imagined it to be hearing the term though. It has as much to do with Doom as Eye of the Beholder has with First Ultima. So while they're technically of the same genre, both look and play entirely different. Day of the Viper is a technological middle step between RPG dungeon crawlers like aforementioned Eye of the Beholder or Dungeon Master and real FPS games like Doom or Gloom. So it's not smooth moving or turning, but in steps and turns by 90 degrees only. That said, while slower playing, it's not boring at all. It features an auto map, various different weapons, upgrades, 33 types of enemies and 25 levels of shooter craze. It's not just about killing baddies though, cause there's quite a few adventuring bits in the game where you have to look for specific items. Namely, and most importantly, 25 floppy disks, one on each level, containing bits of a backup software for the computer that's governing the base that you're on. It went broke some time ago and requires restarting and recovering from original backup disks to function as intended. Which actually brings a tear to the eye reminiscing the times when you did keep your backups on disks, and on multiple ones at times too. Not only they were prone to damage, physical and magnetic, but were also slow and clunky. But these were the times, and to get here we had to be there, if that even makes sense. Anyway, story-wise, on a remote planet, a computer is governing the base, running its day-to-day -day operations and defenses. And as I mentioned before, one day it went rogue, released all the robots it housed and set them into aggressive kill-all mode. Since most humans would have tough time surviving it, Batman's on my couch as usual devouring something fatty and stinky and you're at your computer, the next best thing was to send an android there to complete the mission. And that's what was done. And you, at your computer, are in control of said android. You have to keep him alive, arm him to the teeth as you go through the levels, collect all the floppies, get to the computer and recover the backup so that it could be fixed. Fun. And it actually is surprisingly fun. So if you never had a chance to play it, now is a good time as any to check it out. Disker is a Polish 1994 sci-fi platformer of questionable quality, and I suppose such case was not uncommon for those late Amiga games that came from the country. They were either surprisingly good, much better than they had any right to be so late in the system's life, or disappointingly bad. Usually impressive graphically, but pretty blunt in gameplay department. Sadly, Disker is one of the latter kind. The idea behind it is pretty simple. On your way to Far Off Planet, Exara Hawks, which name I'm no doubt butchered, your spaceship was damaged and you had to emergency land on an unknown alien planet. And for whatever the reason to be able to leave it and get back on your course, you have to find and collect 12 floppy disks scattered around its three continents. Yeah, another game about collecting disks. You heard it right. 
but one that's considerably less fun than the previous. Gameplay mostly consists of going through a series of flip screen platformer screens looking for set floppies and avoiding and shooting various aliens. And if you for whatever the reason decide to play this care, an advice here for you. Stick to avoiding as much as you can as ammo is rather limited. Keep in mind however that any contact with an alien results in your death, so while you should save ammo when you can, don't hesitate to use your gun when your life depends on it. You have to collect dynamite sticks too and use them in appropriate places to destroy walls that block passageways. And that's pretty much it. It may sound like this carries your average Amiga platformer, but despite looking really slick with butter smooth even if a bit slow animations, it's not fun. It gets old fast and I feel only hardcore fans of platformers would ever take upon themselves to complete it. Distant Armies, A Playing History of Chess is an unusual game and a true gem for fans of the classic. It's not only a chess game, it's also a history lesson and a title that will take you through more than 1000 years of chess history introducing you to 10 completely different and yet similarly interesting and strategic variants of the game. And these are Shatranaj, Medieval Chess, Turkish Chess, Decimal Chess, Los Alamos Chess, Courier Chess, Chaturanga, Chinese Chess, Burmese Chess and Byzantine Chess. The game starts with modern version and gradually, so to speak, goes back in time all the way to the oldest game included, Chaturanga, a variant that spawned in India over 1000 years ago. Each of the versions of the game is interesting in its own right and if you're at the very least into chess, you should definitely check it out. If not for anything else then to check out 6x6 or circular board versions or even one where knight and queen are combined into a single figure. If you like the game, it's a blast. And also an encyclopedia of chess describing all variants as history and their rules in detail. So it's a true gem, even if only interesting to a very small subset of all gamers. Interface is a really fun free roam 3D shooter with puzzle elements, but also an incredibly stupid game. And I understand that the plot was supposed to be cyberpunk slash blade runnish, futuristic computerized dystopian hacker story blah blah blah, but it's overthought to the point of being ridiculous, dumb and tiring. In short, in the future there are so called dream tracks that store memories, fantasies, dreams and experiences of people and they're accessible by others for means of entertainment. So obviously only the exciting and interesting ones are saved. But as with most evolved societies, those in power start to slip in subliminal messages into this encouraging people to buy certain products or even have certain political views. Such a powerful tool of control and propaganda has not been seen before, especially that the dream tracks are really addictive and everyone's on them, or using them to be precise. So naturally, you being the warrior for good and freedom that you are, decide to do something about it and destroy one especially dangerous of those tracks. You ask your girlfriend to go and get it and in the same time you jump into Cyberworld to crack the CPU running it to destroy it and help the girl in tracks recovery. Like I said, stupid. But, and it's really the most important thing about it, story is irrelevant here cause gameplay is where it's at. And it is. At. I mean fun. It's fun. It's really good what I'm trying to say here. So you fly this, I think, ship within the three dimensional representation of the system housing the CPU that controls the complex your girlfriend went into to get the truck and you have to defeat the overwhelming program defenses and help her in getting to where she needs to. So you'll be opening doors and passages for her, turning off camera software so that she would get inside virtually unnoticed and unharmed, and assisting her in any way you can while trying to stay alive. First level is a breeze, but from second onward the puzzles and requests from her are more and more demanding and by extension of that the game becomes more challenging but also more fun. As I stated initially, interface is stupid, but it's also gloriously enjoyable if you give it time to familiarize yourself with how it works and what it's all about, and I'm sure that it will no doubt become one of your favorite hidden gem games of yours soon enough. The Humans is fantastic. No really, I'm not just saying that, it's a brilliant little smartly crafted put together game. It looks and sounds great too, so it's a package unlike many, that for a reason unknown to myself was never as popular as it could have, nay, should have been. Especially that conceptually it's not unlike incredibly popular Lemmings that came out just a little earlier and was also a puzzler with levels based on platforms at most times. But I suppose it's the difficulty level that's the culprit here. Cause while most Lemmings levels had to be completed fast using obviously available skills, Humans is slower, more methodical and strategic puzzler, even if also limited by its timer. In theory, in humans, your goal is to help a group of Neanderthals to discover tools, wheel, fire and any other technologies that would help them to develop in who we are now. In theory. In practice, all you have to do in each stage is to get your group of few humans to the exit. 
It will obviously require avoiding death and learning how to use various tools and prehistoric inventions, but they will be introduced gradually level by level so that not to overwhelm you. That said, when taught about something from that level onward, you will be expected not only to remember said things obvious uses, but also think creatively where else they could be applied even if it's not been clearly shown to you. So humans is definitely a thinking man's game. While you can control only one human at the time, you can switch between them, assigning them various different tasks, and you will have to do that all the time, because completing most levels will require teamwork. It's a novel, and while difficult, also incredibly rewarding formula, because in the end it's incredibly gratifying to eventually complete one of those more demanding stages, figuring out how to do it after countless prior failures. While humans may not be the best puzzle platformer or platform puzzler on the Amiga, it's easily one of the best, and a game that deserves more recognition than it ever received. Fighting Spirit is a versus fighting game unlike any other on the Amiga. It tells a story of 10 hardcore brawlers and fighters competing in a hand-to-hand -hand combat tournament to win a chance of becoming gang members of a crime family ruling the city directly under a brutal wing of a crime overlord himself. And before we get any further, I would like to take a closer look at the presentation of the game. Not only it's stellar, colorful and rich in detail, but also rather smooth and very similar to certain style of games you've seen before, namely SNK Fighters. And since Amiga sports of Mortal Kombat games were technically excellent, but the devs of Street Fighter titles dropped the ball on most of their ports, non-digitized, well-playing and great-looking cartoon-like fighters were a wanted product on the Ami. Fighting Spirit fits the build perfectly. It emulates gameplay mechanics of the best titles found in the arcades superbly, using Amiga's hardware capabilities, both graphic and sound alike, to their fullest. And in the process, serving incredible experience and hella fun game. That in 1996 sadly came too little too late, long after Commodore was gone and Amiga users were either mostly gone too, or in the process of moving to other newer systems like PlayStation or PC. All fighters obviously have their own unique techniques, moves and special attacks, some can even transform into other creatures features, and the game supports two button controls. Which for console players may seem like a moot point and something not worth mentioning whatsoever, but for the last few remaining Amiga users at the time it was a godsend, as they were long tired of 99.9% .9 of games using single button controls. And it also meant that we could minimize joystick gymnastics quite a bit and didn't have to memorize complicated 17 joystick moves long combinations to issue simple special attacks. If you like good fighters, there's just a few that can compare to fighting spirit on the Amiga. Klax is an action puzzler with very simple mechanics that's surprisingly addictive. It's also a port from the arcades and it's conceptually a mix between Tetris and Columns. The game board is divided in two, top and bottom. Top is composed of five lanes that the colorful blocks fall from continuously, bottom houses the puddle that you control directly and five storage areas for blocks. The idea here is simple, all you have to do is arrange blocks in such a way that they would form rows, columns and diagonals of at least three of the same color. When they do, they are removed from the screen, freeing more space in the storage area. Oh, it's worth pointing out that the diagonals reward the most points. But you can also, if you manage to that is, create combos, meaning rows, columns and slash or diagonals all at once. Clax consists of 99 more and more demanding levels, increasing gradually in block dropping speed and number of colors. Many levels have no requirements, but as you progress they will start appearing for some stages, like having to make certain number of columns or rows, or getting a set number of points, or even surviving a set number of blocks. It may not seem like much when spoken about, but when you're actually playing Clax and everything seems to be happening fast all at once, that you can barely contain all the chaos, having to fulfill even a simple task is a lot. Thankfully you can store up to 5 blocks on your puddle before needing to drop them somewhere, so especially in those latter, more difficult stages, it will become crucial to plan ahead and strategize when and where to drop each of them. So, as you see, technically speaking Klax is simple and it takes but a second to figure out how to play it. But mastering the game is entirely different thing, and only most agile and sharp minds will be able to go through entire game with ease. In 1996, Amiga along with Commodore were officially long gone. Most owners moved to other systems and the dwindling Amiga gamer population was on the verge of disappearing entirely. It was also a year in which I finally gave up on my beloved system and moved to PC. At the time, I did not think much of it, other than having access to much better and more impressive graphically games. Today, I feel I should have kept my Amiga as as the time went by and missed it more and more. Obviously, I can do both today, emulate any Amiga game I'd like or even fire up my real A500 and play games natively. Though I gotta be honest here, I have no screen I could connect it to, so... 
Anyway, in 1996 there weren't many of us left, so releasing games on Amiga was questionable choice by any of the devs that spent months if not years working on their game. One of them, however, decided to drop their latest game, a versus slash tournament fighter Capital Punishment. A word of warning here, my words are going to be a bit polarizing, as unlike most gaming mags of the time, I am not a huge fan of it. Quite the opposite, in fact. So, you may and most likely do feel different about it. Capital Punishment is an abomination of a child spawned by ungodly love between Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat. At least that's what it feels that the devs aimed for. The graphics are drawn and not digitized, and yet it's overly brutal with bucketfuls of blood and gruesome finishes galore. And to give justice where it's due, the presentation in terms of both graphics and sound design is short of magnificent. It looks incredible, there are some neat visual effects in some of the stages and sounds are crisp and chunky, as you would have expected them in the best in the genre. But, and from my point of view it's probably the biggest issue with Capital Punishment, it tried to be both of these four mentioned games in the same time, without realizing that despite representing the same genre, they are fundamentally different. So it tried to be all, and ended up being a master of none. Don't get me wrong though, I don't hate or consider it one of the worst fighters on the Amiga, not the case at all here, I just think that other than the presentation, it's unspectacular. There are some nice and interesting ideas all throughout, but it feels like the devs tie them all together by thin imaginary invisible strings and not a coherent design direction, resulting in a game that works, but that's as much as I can say about it, as I don't find it very fun at all. All that said, at the very least, if for nothing else, it's worth checking out to see all the brutal finishers. Prospector in the Mazes of Exor is a follow-up to Aerial Exor and an Amiga-exclusive boulder dash like action puzzler. It contains 15 levels found in the original and additional 15 new ones for a total of 30 madness-filled stages. If that wasn't enough, and for whatever the reason after completing the game you'd crave more, there's a built-in level editor. Though completing your own creations does not sound like fun, so either find someone to make them for you or download them off the internet. I'm sure they can be found somewhere in the depths of Aminet or the likes. Still, the main objective of each stage is to guide two characters through it, collecting blue balloons. These two have to work together as a team, and yeah, I know what I just said, and despite that, it's still a single-player game, so that they would help each other crossing locked off areas or navigating various dangers and obstacles. There's quite a few puzzles to complete, and some of the stages may have just one correct way of beating them. So while you may fail a couple of times here and there, figuring out how to complete a particularly difficult stage can feel really rewarding. It doesn't change the fact, though, that Prospectors' levels are pretty uneven, and some may be considerably more demanding than others, and not necessarily in an increasing order of stages as you go through the game. Graphics and sounds are A-OK for a puzzler, even if unspectacular by Amiga standard, and overall Prospector in the Mazes of Exor feels like a genuinely fun and addictive game, even if a bit more on the demanding side. Brat is like Lemmings, but not really a nut at all, but it also is, just a little. I know, now you have no idea what it's all about, but I'll do my best to explain. Which is not saying a lot as my mental capabilities are at best limited. I'm not man but after all. I'll give it a go anyway. So, it's an arcade puzzler in isometric top-down view in which you have to help the titular Brad to the end of each stage. Very similar to what you do in Lemmings, just in different perspective and he's all on his own rather than in a pack of panicking and blindly walking forward creatures. Come to think of it, he does walk blindly without any care in the world straight to his death if you're not there to stop him. So... he's as stupid as a lemming is? While our brat walks like a silly potato that he is, you can actually direct him by dropping arrows on his way and when he gets to one he immediately changes direction to the one indicated on it. There are also items Brad can pick up by walking over them, and they can be any manner of odd things, like a milk bottle that will restart the level from the point you die at, and not from the beginning, a dynamite stick that you can tell Brad to use to destroy rock boulders, or even a stop sign that pauses his movement until you tell him to keep going again. There's few more, but you get the gist, I hope. The screen scrolls on its own, so same as with Lemmings, while you have few seconds of a headroom viewing the stage before Brad gets through it, you often gotta act fast and place all the direction arrows and items correctly. It can become hectic at times, especially that there's also environmental dangers everywhere, so expect to replay some levels more than once. Brat is composed out of 12 levels, each consisting of 3 stages, so it's not a small game and will take a while to complete given its challenge level. Is it as good as Lemmings? It's not, to be honest, but it's not far off, so if you enjoy those demanding action puzzlers, it's definitely one to track down and play. I prefer cats to dogs, which should not come as a surprise as I live with Batman, and he's like a big, hairy, obnoxious and always hungry cat. 
The only difference between them is that he's much more expensive to keep and care for, but fortunately at the very least he wipes himself and flushes the toilet on his own. So while I care more about cats, they're definitely not men's best friends. Dogs are though. And today's first game is about one. And probably the best example of the man's best friend in action. In Sleepwalker you play as Ralph, the dog, of more or less unspecified race. And you care for a man, or your boy named Lee to be precise. Especially that he's a titular sleepwalker. And every night without fail he starts walking straight ahead with no care whatsoever. Dreaming and walking, adding to your stress and shortening your potential lifespan from heart related issues with every minute you're playing. Your task in each of six huge parallax scrolling main levels is to make sure that nothing happens to your master and that he does not wake up. And let me tell you, it's not going to be easy. Cause anytime he hits anything he loses a bit of sleep. And if at any point he wakes up from his slumber, you'll lose a life. Since gameplay is in real time, you have to be fast and crafty in caring for your friend, and it's not unusual to find him on the edge of the rooftop, just a step away from an open sewer, mindlessly walking into pools of water, or even going straight into a big and mean bodies. So you have to be a few steps ahead of Lee, trying to find, recognize and neutralize any possible dangers in his way before he gets anywhere remotely near them. While doing so, make sure to come back and check on him often, as he has a unique skill of finding himself in new kinds of unexpected dangers all the time. So even if you think that you've done a great job clearing a path for him, it's good to track back and make sure that he didn't trip on his own foot and landed his head straight into a rusty nail sticking out of an odd random plank. I may be exaggerating a little, but only to make sure that you're on your toes. Despite entirely different kind of presentation and unique gameplay mechanics, the closest gameplay-wise title I could compare Sleepwalker to would be the Brat that we've spoke about in the last video. They're not identical, but they're in the same ballpark. Oh, and they're equally as fun. Trottlers, or as I like to call them, Spider Lemmings, is an arcade puzzle game similar to, well, Lemmings, with a mix of Boulder Dash here and there for good measure. Similar but not identical, but nearly as good as these classics though. The gameplay premise and the main objective is very akin to that of Lemmings, to guide a group of silly sausages from where they start to an exit in the form of a single doorway. They all however somehow have been bitten by radioactive spiders one by one, and what a coincidence this must have been, right? So they all can also walk on walls and ceilings. But fortunately, that's all they do, walk. And making sure that they're on the right path is your job. Especially that the levels are hardly ever tripped from point A on the left to point B on the right and most often than not the exit is somewhere in the middle of the screen. And you'll have to stretch that brain muscle of yours a lot to get them there safely. If that wasn't enough, there's no special skills, no intricate machinery that could help you and all you can do is remove and create blocks. And that's what you'll be doing. Placing and destroying them strategically to create a path for the pack of dummies. There's a limit to number of blocks you can use in each stage and while it may sometimes, especially in latter levels, feel a bit restraining, you can always pick up blocks you've placed before and reuse them. So keep that in mind. If that was all however, Throttlers would be a game worth of 10-15 level tops, and no more. But it has 175 of them. So what makes it interesting then? Well, there's a lot of various dangers and hazards and you're introduced to them gradually, learning how they work, usually over a couple or so levels each, so that to familiarize yourself with them. In the same time, the game gradually becomes more and more challenging. But wait, that's not all. Then there are troddlers of different political views, left and right wing, liberals and conservationists, if you will. They cannot mix. Oh boy, how they cannot mix at all. Keep them separate or they will literally kill each other. You are, however, a good boy, a good man or a woman for that matter too, and you do not pick sides. You pick life and you want to save them all. And you'll have to do so while keeping them as far from each other as possible. Because of all that, Troddlers is not an easy game, but it's really fun nonetheless. And if you manage to find someone to play it with in simultaneous multiplayer, not only gets a tad easier, but also instantly becomes one of the best multiplayer puzzle games ever conceived this side of Milky Way. Nebulous 2, Pogo A Go Go, despite being the most stupidly named game in this video, is actually really really fun. It's a second outing, a follow-up to previous well-known fan favorite Nebulous and sadly a game that was never as well received as the original was. Even though I liked it better than the first one. It's an action puzzler with a story and many new gameplay mechanics. In short, you have to climb to the top of 8 towers taken over by the evil Anko. Yes, you heard that right. Uncle. Fortunately, it's not a literal uncle, but a nickname of an interstellar crime boss. When you reach the top, avoiding many dangers and killing countless hordes of enemies on your way, you gotta topple them all by pressing the self-destruct button. Towers, not the enemies. You follow? When you do, you have to scale the same tower once more to repair it. Cause while the quote-unquote uncle cannot have it for his, I'm sure of it, dark and nefarious schemes, they cannot stay distracted as they house machinery responsible for cleansing air. 
So yeah, you do the same thing once more for each tower, just to get it rebuilt. So you could say that there's 16 levels overall. Even if your mission is not the easiest out there, you're not defenseless. There's 6 upgrades you can find and they can be a true game changer if used properly. I mean even as simple as a helipack can be used both offensively or to fly up the tower to scout the dangers ahead or presents that may contain keys to doors, rockets or many other items crucial for your success. Other than the main stages, there are also three bonus levels, one in the air, one on the ground and one, you guessed it right, underwater. And they are more varied and fun than in original. The main gimmick, or trick if you prefer to call it that, of Nebulous is that the towers rotate when you walk around them climbing upwards. So not only it's nice effect visually speaking, but you have to remember too that while something may not be readily visible at first, it doesn't mean that it's not there on the other side of the tower, be it a bonus door or your 15th death in a row, all equally plausible. Nebulous 2 is not easy, but it's a fun game that deserved more love and recognition than it received, sadly being overshadowed by still good but not as good original. Could you imagine Sid Meier's game, any of his titles, really to be obscure? To not reach the heights of popularity and recognition? To only be largely forgotten and known to a handful of players' gem? Well, there is one. It's also an amazing game, same as all of his titles are, but only ever remembered by few that played it. Sid Meier's Covert Action is a unique blend of strategy, action and adventure, all rolled into one. And believe it or not, it's amazing. You play a skilled and deadly free agent hired by CIA to investigate an ongoing criminal and terrorist activities. Why do they outsource rather than use their own? Hard to tell, but if I had to guess, I'd say that they must have heard of your countless heroic acts, how you saved the world and universe on numerous occasions, and how, generally speaking, a stand-up person you are. They just have no one better or even comparable in the slightest skill and experience-wise that is. Because Menbat seems to be all about those chips and gummy bears these days. So you're either he or she, Maximilian or Maxine Remington respectively, and not many games at the time short of RPGs allowed for a choice of gender, so that's perhaps a small but still welcome addition. Covert action is divided into missions, they're all time limited, and you have to uncover criminal conspiracy details in each before the time runs out. You do so by completing various spy-themed mini-games like combat, cryptography, driving and wiretapping. They're all pretty fun and reward details like locations, names, photos of people involved in crime or connected to the game plot. After each mission you may also receive a promotion, so in a typical for Sid Meier's manner, the game is point based meaning that at the end of it, same as in Civilization, you're compared in a score table against named records. Which is kinda pointless if you're the only one playing cause you're so amazing that you're scoring top points every single time. But it may be imported to some other less skilled gamers, so... For the sake of transparency I have to make two things clear before I talk about our next game. First, Center-Based Science Fiction Simulation, yeah, that's the title, is a game that I've not only never played before, but also never heard of it either. So all I'd say in this little preview will be 100% based on what I've found about it online. And second, and this may be more important to me, personally, my favorite sandwich is BLT. Hold the L and hold the T. Since all that's cleared, let's carry on. Center-Based is Reline Software's second game and a spiritual follow-up to their earlier Oil Imperium which I actually did play it and enjoyed quite a lot, especially with friends. And center base is very similar conceptually, meaning that you run a business and have to do better than your free opponents. This time you're not drilling for oil, but are a ruthless landlord competing for riches taken straight out of innocent tenants' pockets. It kinda hits close to home, so I'm not gonna expand on the team anymore. The city is composed out of four boroughs, each containing six housing slots, upon which you can build apartment houses. Erecting buildings is not enough, however, and you have to make sure that your tenants have all the basic necessities that they may require. So water, food and energy. All of which can either be purchased on the market or acquired in respective supply locations by action minigames. Same as in Oil Imperium, it's not really only a business simulation, but most importantly a party game for four friends who are bored with each other and seek to end those friendships as fast as possible. So naturally you have a whole set of various shady activities and sabotages that you can unleash on others. You can spread rumors about them, hire tax to steal goods from them, or even straight up send robotic attack force to occupy the real estate, effectively bringing it under your wing slash protection. And many other things in between. If center base is at least half as good as Oil Imperium was, and on the first glance it looks even more interesting if I'm to be honest, then it can be a hell of a fun party game to play with friends. Not as much against CPU, I'm afraid. Tale of Rogue Trooper is as old as the time itself. We're somehow sadly always drawn towards conflict with powers shifting and those who don't have it fight to grasp it and keep it for themselves only. Rogue Trooper, despite only being a silly potato of a game, is all about us humans, 
Earthlings, broken biological machines with a faulty genetic programming that's causing us to never be satisfied with what we have and push to get more to amass to rule. We suck. Rogue Trooper takes place on a planet called New Earth. Not new, but new. N-U. Anyway, the planet is divided into two opposing factions, those that live in the north, and you guessed it right, those that inhabit the south. And they cannot stand each other, clashing for the domination on a regular basis. Until eventually, after eons of fighting, what's left of New Earth cannot be called anything else other than the barren wasteland. You play a southern POW stranded inside the northern base. The game is composed out of four levels, each telling a different part of your escape and return home story. In first, which is your typical action platformer, you punch and then shoot hundreds of enemies trying to find your army gear, evidence of who betrayed the self and the ship to escape the base with. Second and third levels play similar to each other. You're inside the ship in a third person view, first chasing rogue general traitor and shooting him down, and then coming back to your southern base through toxic hallucinogen biological weapon used by North on southern lands. North, it seems, never heard of Geneva Accords. And finally, in the last and fourth level, you're back in your base, just as it is being raided by Northerners. It's also an action platformer, same as the first level was, and you have to deliver evidence of betrayal to the High Command, while obviously killing all the bodies on your way. Rogue Trooper is based on a comic book of the same name. I've never read or even heard of it, but the game itself is actually quite fun. The titular Rolling Ronnie is a clown on roller skates. I know, terrifying. And it's a typical arcade action platformer similar to Mario or Sonic with some novelty added to this long-running pirate genre formula. The game is divided into 9 big, two-way scrolling levels in which all you really have to do is get enough cash to be able to buy a bus ticket to get to the next one. So money works kinda like rings in Sonic or coins in Mario. How you collect it though is different, cause it doesn't just lie around waiting to be picked up, you have to earn it. And you do so either by shooting bodies or working, by delivering parcels all around the city. So it's simple, right? Kill some enemies, drop some packages, bada beep, bada boom, bobs your uncle and you're done. Not really. Because you have to manage finances responsibly. And that's what everyone wants in their games, a lesson on assets management, right? So while saving up for a ticket, you also have to make occasional purchases of upgrades to be able to traverse through the level safely. You can do so in shops, obviously, and there's always one somewhere in each level. And they're surprisingly well supplied, offering super high jumps, bombs, enemy freeze gadget in the form of rotten stinky cheese and a couple more. They are all humorously named and it's a pretty blunt type of humor, kinda like the one you can expect from this very channel, so you should feel right at home playing the game. Rolling Run's graphics are decent, or really good, if you consider that it runs on an Amiga with just a half meg of RAM, and overall it's a pretty fun and unique platformer, that while feeling familiar and like something you've played many times before also add its own blend, own flavor to the formula, not to feel too stale. And the fact that its difficulty curve is just perfect, slowly and gradually increasing in challenge without any sudden spikes of it, makes it a title ideal for both young and more mature audiences, if they're not afraid of clowns, that is. Rubicon is really fun. I should really end this preview here and just let you watch it for the next two minutes. But if I did so, it would kinda broke the whole fair use doctrine of law by not providing any commentary or content on top of the video from another channel. It would be just a replaying of it. So basically theft. So, I'm afraid that you're stuck with me and man bat. I'm Batman. Alright buddy, Batman. You, you know I get those two confused cause I could never figure out which half of you is man and which is bat. Is it top or bottom? Hello? Well, it seems he's ignoring me, so let's get back to Rubicon. It's an action-packed shooter platformer that's unlike virtually anything else you've seen on the Amiga or most other platforms of the time for that matter. At first glance, it may look like a Contra or Metal Slug-like game, and while it's not a far-fetched assumption, it's not really the case. Simply put, it's a boss rush type of a game where you fight with plethora of completely different looking and requiring different strategies bosses intertwined with short action platforming sections. It may actually very well be one of, if not the first boss rush type of game to ever exist, as the genre really started gaining traction in 2000s, mainly thanks to Shadow of the Colossus, and before that I don't think I can really recall any other games than this one representing it. Oh well, such is life. Someone will most likely drop a name or two in the comments that I just somehow totally forgot about, and there are obvious examples of it. So, the bosses, they are not thematically connected in any way and you may very well be fighting huge skeletons, dinosaurs, tanks, robots, alien queens and anything in between. There's a lot of them, and they're all fun. I think I said that already, but it's worth pointing out once more that Rubicon is surprisingly addicting for a title that's perhaps first of its kind. Graphics are pretty good, though not groundbreaking in any way, and sounds are A-OK -okay too. But gameplay, which you most likely figure out already, is really cool. And that's what's best about it. So if you're in the mood for something new, even today, and really obscure, there's hardly any better on the Amiga. 
Slayer is an American trash metal band known for such hit songs as Angel of Death or Raining Blood. I only know them by their name, but here you go. A little trivia knowledge that you may find useful one of those days when you're slumdog millionaire into riches. Think of me in this video then. And make sure to come back to it and leave a like and subscribe. That's all I ask for. Maybe share it, because you know, you'll be rich beyond belief and that's just a click or two for you and the world to me. Ok, let's get back to our scheduled programming, sorta. Slayer is horizontally scrolling shoot a map of a bit questionable quality, that was much better offering on a C64 than it is on the Amiga. Don't get me wrong, it's not a bad or broken game in any way imaginable, it's just so mid, so average, that if you were to put it in between 5 or 6 other shooters of the time, it would have disappeared between them forever to never be seen again. What I'm trying to say here, is that nothing in it stands out. Everything is genre standard and what you expect to find in a shooter, nothing more, nothing less. And for some this may be enough and all they really need and that's cool too. But if you've played as many games as I have, you'd probably appreciate the novelty and something that is generally not seen often in the game design as much as I do. Still, despite not raising eyebrows, dropping jaws or ball sacks for that matter either, Slayer is a very competent shooter if you want to do just that. Shoot mindlessly thousands upon thousands of enemies in space going from left to right, killing anything and everything that's in your way. So if that's what you're after today, or just need to get your mind off things, daily troubles or such, it can be a useful escape. Also, it has the same name as forementioned and unknown to me band, but given what's written about them in Wikipedia, they're a pretty big thing in metal scene. Sansushi is a pretty fun, if a bit uneven and technically unimpressive Amiga action platformer that is most interesting because it actually should never be. Wait, what? Why, you may wonder? Well, it originally released on Atari ST and then the devs ported it to the Amiga. Pretty standard fare for the time, no surprises here really. But then they've sent it to all the big gaming mags to get it reviewed, to get some public interest going for it, hype as we call it today. Also, nothing out of ordinary. And that's it. Apparently, even though it was feature completed, ready to be mass produced and sold, the developers lost the original discs with a source code and binaries. Yep, that's how important is good backup kits. I would have inserted a sponsored backup software out here, but since no one in the right mind would want to advertise on this channel, just imagine me doing it in the cringest way possible. As a result of all that, Sanshushi officially never released on the Amiga. Luckily, a disc with a working copy was found some time later, and now the game is available online for download. So you can experience what could have been, but haven't, in 1992. Sanshushi is divided into six worlds, each built out of two smaller sections. First, outdoor, where you travel on foot, platforming your way through hundreds of enemies, collecting pickups and coins that then can be spent in shops for upgrades. In second section, you fly on a cloud to get to the end stage boss and defeat him. Overall, you have to kill six of those bosses and collect items that they drop to save your king, whose health, according to game story, is quickly deteriorating and only those pickups can save him. While story is not very creative or captivating at all, it's a platformer, so all we should really care about is gameplay. And it's okay. Yep, just that. You're not gonna write home about it and you're not gonna be instantly put off of it either. It's an average action platformer with a very spiky difficulty curve, which is probably the only annoying thing about it. It is, however, worth tracking down, if not for anything else, then just to see a game that should not exist. Medieval Warriors is a fantasy team turn-based strategy game butler. Confusing, I know, but I can't really call it anything else. It's not just a strategy, and there's no story to it. It's kinda like those pull of radiance battles, but without any plot and overarching role-playing bits. It is not simplistic, however, and there is surprisingly a lot of depth and playability in the four included maps, especially if you have someone else to play it with. The players, be it human or human versus CPU, are divided into two teams, red and blue, each with 12 proud and courageous warriors of various skill sets, strong and weak points, and each being able to wield a different weapon. Heck, they even have their own names too. So it seems like the game was planned to be something else, something more advanced and bigger, but ended up just a turn-based battler. Whatever, we will never know after all. I mean, I sorta have a world's greatest detective here with me on my couch, but I doubt that he'd be willing to help in researching that. Would you? Would you help me find details about Medieval Warriors making, buddy? I'm Batman. Well done, here you go, as helpful as always. Every map in Medieval Warriors is a bit different and poses a unique tactical challenge, and while one may be just the two forts on opposing sides of the map, another may be a maze of corridors. So all that needs to be taken into consideration when placing your troops, to best use their strong skill sets and protect their weaknesses. Medieval Warriors as it stands is an average game at best that had some neat ideas and looks like a very decent battle module of a bigger role-playing game. But it's not, and for what it is, I cannot really recommend it for more than a game or two. Preferably with a friend, cause CPU is same as in most other games. So completely freaking useless. CPU.
The City of Death, aka Miasto Śmierci in Original, is an obscure late 1996 Polish sci-fi action shooter. And while it's not spectacular in any way imaginable, it's not an absolute stinker as many of those very late low-budget games were. A mad scientist wants to take over the world, so given the quality of the game in subject, I'd call him, let's say, a budget Lex Luthor. So Lex Luth, with OR missing, because of the lack of financing. And you're the secret agent who's given literally no choice but to jump behind remote controls of a modern bipedal battle robot called MOA and stop him. Preferably in that particular order. MOA is armed with five different weapons. No, 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 I think I got that wrong. Let me start again. MOA is armed with five identical weapons, only distinguishable between each other with the sound that they make and perceivable power. The gameplay takes place on two separate planes. First is quote unquote overworld labyrinth like map of the titular city where you move between the different sectors. It's also where with a bit of luck you may find ammo for weapons other than the most basic one, which has unlimited ammo. Then there are battle screens to which the game switches whenever there's enemy forces in one of four mentioned sectors. These are usually pretty detailed, depicting blocks of apartments in various stages of degradation and generally speaking don't look bad other than using very limited yellowish palette for whatever the reason. This is where you face the enemies, Operation Wolf style. And despite being very simplified version of the classic, those bits are actually kinda enjoyable. For what they are, that is. So you shoot tons of bodies there, some of them are exploding in fiery blaze cause they're cyborgs, while others, well, there's no way going around it, also explode but in pools of blood. So they're humans, I think. Perhaps androids. I didn't look too deep into the game's near non-existent lore. To complete the stage slash zone you have to kill a certain number of enemies, and when you do, the game comes back to the overhead map view, regardless if there are any enemies left on the screen or not, which is odd, but whatever. So not to waste any more of your time, that's pretty much it, nothing more to this little game. If you liked Operation Wolf or Cabal, you can check it out, there's a chance you'll find it in yourself to complete it, if you didn't, then there's really nothing here for you. Metalo is a side-scrolling action shooter platformer, and on the first glance that's all that it is. You go from left to right, always without fail, and shoot bajillions, quintillions, quadrillions of bodies. Now, said numbers may not exist, but imagine the biggest one you can and multiply it. That's how many of them are. As many as there were in Turrican, maybe more. The story of the reasoning behind annihilating all these enemies is irrelevant, all you have to do is keep pushing forward and killing all that moves. Simple as that. And as a shooter, Metal Law is rather fun. The game is divided into three worlds, spread over six levels, so to each, and they're all uniquely designed and beautifully crafted to the last pixel in size detail. There's plenty of parallax foreground elements scrolling as you traverse through the game, adding to the feeling of depth. The sprites are big and detailed and smoothly animated. The music by legendary Chris Hulsbeck is as earwormy as you'd expect from him. And the weapons can be powered up by collecting gems for that extra oomph when shooting everywhere, anywhere, all at once. Overall, the game seems fantastic. So what's not to love here, right? Well, it seems there's a couple of things that could be improved slightly. For one, the levels are not very long and completing the game feels like a breeze, especially, and here we're on to the second, that Metal Law is not very demanding. Sure, it's perhaps not the easiest game out there, but seasoned arcade shooter gamers will not find it challenging in the slightest. To summarize, Metal Law is beautiful, sounds great, plays really good, even if just for a little while, so it's really worth checking out. Nathan Never is a side-scrolling action shooter with some basic adventuring elements based on an Italian comic book of the same name. It's also a game that I really wanted to like. It represents everything that I should enjoy in the arcade shooter, so has great graphics, a lot of action and smooth animations, but somehow misses the spot. For me, so don't get discouraged just yet. You'll get plenty of time to do so in a minute or so when I'm done talking about it. So unusually to how I do things on this channel, I will try to talk about it in order. So good first, then bad, and finally a conclusion. Usually it's all over the place, so it's gonna be a new approach for me too. Anyway, Nate and Never's graphics are fantastic. Nay, they're incredible. As good if not better than those in Shadow of the Beast games. In fact, it could be Shadow of the Beast 4, or better yet, 0.5, because we all know how they work. The lower the number in the series, the better the game looks. The higher the number, the less impressive the visuals are, but the gameplay is better. In fact, there are posters in-game advertising non-existent Shadow of the Beast 5, so yeah. The animations are smooth to the point of being perhaps too fluid and look odd because of that. There's I don't know how many, but probably about 50,000 individual parallax backgrounds all melting into a beautiful sea of presentation. It's magnificent and it cannot be overstated. The enemies got the same attention to their looks and animations as your character and backgrounds did, so at least graphics-wise it's a win. Sounds and music? 
Well, music is pretty good, perhaps not the best for the system, but there's a quite few really varied tunes and they have that action sci-fi vibe to them. Sounds are appropriate and there's not much more I want to add about them. And gameplay? Now, ignoring the fact that all the dialogues are in Italian only, the gameplay is a bit lacking. I mean, sure, on first glance it seems fun when you run around killing various enemies, searching through their bodies, entering buildings and such, but the action feels lackluster. Not to mention that the game feels like an overly complicated maze in which you have no clue where to go next because you don't speak the language. Unless you do, and then scratch what I just said about it. The enemies are another case of bad. More often than not they just stand there stiff, waiting for you to come closer and then instantly open fire. As if you just entered the aggro range years before the term was even coined. So naturally you fire back and… and this is where the whole game falls apart. There's no weight to your shots, you have no visual feedback whatsoever if you're hitting them or they you, nothing. There's just few of you, you on one side, enemies on the other, shooting at each other, standing there like sticks popping out of the dog's poo. Perfectly still not moving an inch until one of you suddenly falls down to the ground. It's terrible, looks bad and feels even worse. Like world's worst make-believe war shootouts. So, Nathan Never is a great example of a game that could not be saved by its presentation when the gameplay is so disappointing. Oh, and before we move to another game I just quickly want to show you my favorite enemy. Daniel-san from Karate Kid who's in the game too. But not kicking and punching, oh no, that would not fit the team here, he's wielding a semi-automatic rifle. Oh my god, okay, I'm done with this one. It's only fair that after covering a terrible Italian game that I would cover equally as bad one from Poland, right? Well, it's not a requirement, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Metal Kombat, despite what the title and how it's written may suggest, has as much to do with Mortal Kombat as hot dogs have with fine dining. Sure, you'll munch on one every once in a while when you're in a rush or watching a sporting event, but you're not gonna take a girl on a hot dog date, right? Unless you will, then kudos to you sir for not giving any shits whatsoever. You're probably the coolest odd potato that has ever walked the air. Anyway, Metal Kombat is more similar to Final Fight, so it's a side-scrolling beat-em-up. Scrolling is a very strong word though when talking about this game. And even comparing it to Amiga's weak port of Final Fight is criminal, as that game was much better than this could ever dream of being. But what is it all about? Well, in the post-apocalyptic future where all human life is long gone, only machines survived. And them being originally made by us, they've inherited some of our traits. Namely aggression, hate and prejudice. So you know, A plus stuff. And since there's only two factions of machines left, they fight for control. And you're never gonna guess what they are. Go ahead, try. I'll give you a couple of seconds. I'm afraid you're wrong. The two factions that survive are based on Amigas and PCs. And these computers power the machines. Cool, right? It is. But sadly the gameplay is not there to support the idea. You can pick one of six available robots that vary a little in how they fight and you have to take them through 14 boring ass levels. Being able to play it with a friend in a cringe and bad game experience induced evening seems to be the only really redeeming thing going for Metal Kombat. It's as bad as the previous game was and also hardly worth your time. But it is rare, so for educational purposes you should really play it at least once. Pinky is an Amiga exclusive and always scrolling platformer like you've not seen before, until now. So is me shouting world premiere like in modern Xbox and PlayStation shows appropriate here? Let's see. World premiere. The titular Pinky has been assigned by the king of all pinkies, which kinda sounds like a pretty decent title for an adult movie, the king of all pinkies, never mind. Batman, remove that bit from the final cut please, thanks. So, the king assigned him with a task of finding and recovering space dinosaur eggs so that they would not go extinct. A noble case indeed, so our little hero sets out on a quest to do just that in around 60 level strong platformer. While Pinky is courageous, he's also quite fragile, just like, well, your Pinky. And if he's hit by an enemy of any kind in any way, he dies instantly. Now that's a pretty big problem for a hero wannabe who's on a mission to save whole species from being wiped out. But he's far from defenseless, he has his Pinky Pot. Which coincidentally is also an excellent title for an adult movie. Sweet sweet Pinky Pot. Anyway, said Pinky Pot is like a mixture of unicycle, tank and inspector gadget contraptions all rolled into one. When you're in it, you're invulnerable and it also has many many different usage scenarios. It can be used to elevate you to high and difficult to reach places, it can shoot out a fist if necessary and it holds X collected. But that's not all, cause you can upgrade it to even add more functionalities to it. Why would you do that though? Well the answer is what I haven't told you about yet, so what the real goal of the game is and not the story. You have to locate, collect and bring back to the exit free dino X per level. And they're very often hidden away in hard to reach locations which will require you to figure out how to best use Pinkie Pot's functions to get to them. So while Pinkie is a platformer, it's also chock full of environmental puzzles and since the levels are ginormous in size, it will take a long time to complete it. 
So while pastel colored beautiful graphics may sway you into thinking that pink is for kids only, puzzles and unique original gameplay mechanics are something you may actually find yourself enjoying more than you'd think. If you played the first Rise of the Rabbits, you might be surprised here. Cause while that one was Dyna Blaster slash Bomberman clone, this second outing is clearly modeled around side-scrolling platformers like Mario. So you run around collecting stars and either avoiding or killing buddies by jumping on their heads. Does it bring any bells? Despite that and the presentation of it, it's not just a ripoff. The blocks are much smaller than in Mario and cannot be destroyed in any way. In fact, there's very little variety to them and to all objects and enemies used in the game, because, believe it or not, it's not a commercial product, but a public domain title created purely for the 32 kilobyte coding competition. And yeah, you heard that right, the entire game fits in just 32 kilobytes. On the other hand, it's a tiny game. Literally tiny, as I believe there's only one level in it if I remember correctly. Still, it's very impressive graphically and conceptually for something of such minuscule size. It's probably also why it's such an unknown little title. Cause not only it was more like a glorified tech demo, it was also not commercially available anywhere and released in 1998, long after Amiga stopped being a viable mainstream gaming platform. It's an interesting little find though, so that's why we talk about it here. Oh, and unlike 95% of Amiga games, it actually uses fire for jump rather than joystick movement. So that's nice. Photonstorm is a multi-scrolling top-down action shooter and also as simple mechanically game in a genre as they come. It's not bad though, as in this simplicity lies Photonstorm's playability. It's basically a wave shooter, wherein in each level, wave of enemies attack and you have to dispose of them all as fast and as good as you manage to. In the same time collecting as many plutonium pots as you can. Now, what are plutonium pots you may wonder? Would you accept if I just told you to not to think too much of them and just grab them whenever you can? I'm Batman. Yes, yes you are Bruce, now get back to napping. Sorry guys, he has this odd habit of screaming his name whenever he wakes up, even if just for a second. And since he went through like 5 bowls of ice cream a little while ago, he's been fast asleep napping. Coming back to Photomstorm though, since you clearly won't agree on playing it without knowing what those mystical plutonium pods are, let me explain. In a game's short and simple story, they're what aliens used to power their battle stars that's said to be capable of destroying all of us if given a chance. And we don't want that to happen. At least I don't, so that's why I'm telling you all about it. So you got a Pokemon, those bad boys like there's no tomorrow. Pokemon meaning collect them all. Since you can actually use the plutonium pots yourself, it's even more important to do so. Between those enemy wave levels, in which you shoot left, shoot right and a little bit to the top and down too, heck, you even shoot diagonally here and there, spreading death and destruction all around, you get to use those pots in Stargate Traversal. I know, I'm dropping another name bomb on you and expect you to know what it is. So when you complete a wave, you jump into the aforementioned Stargate, which transports you to the location of the next wave. But when you're in that hyperspatial tunnel that you travel through, you have to navigate it carefully, avoiding contact with its walls. And plutonium pots increase your shielding in it. So yeah. Since we all now know all that there is to know about Photon Storm, let's summarize it. It's a wave shooter that's very simple in its design, but also pretty fun in its gameplay loop. And it's Jeff Minter's game, which I feel I could have mentioned initially and spare all of us this whole tirade. So if you like his other games or action shooters in general, Photon Storm is worth adding to your collection. I don't care about sports. I don't play sports, I don't watch sports, and if possible, I don't talk about them. And it's not a surprise to those who followed this channel for a while. But I don't mind an occasional sports game if it's either interesting, playable, or works great in multiplayer. Preferably all three, but a combination of two will do sometimes too. Well, there's also Pro Soccer 2190, but I've said my piece about that abomination more than once, and I don't wanna ever come back to it. It will probably be the name I'll scream maniacally in my deathbed on my last day here while simultaneously soiling myself. If you're curious, I have an old but still relevant review of it. It's possibly the worst game in all planes of existence, this and imaginary alike. Anyway, projectile that we'll talk about today is not bad. I mean, it's not great when played alone, but if you have someone with you, it can be a blast. Up to three players can play simultaneously and it's an odd mix of speedball, hockey and something else, but I can't put my finger on what it is. The quote-unquote pitch is composed out of five arenas arranged in a cross shaped and interconnected by tunnels. The camera always follows the pack, changing rooms as it does, the three out of four outside rooms all belong to a different player and house their goals which they need to defend while also trying to score on the opponents. The fourth room has all four goals and it's where the most crazy and chaotic action takes place. As you can imagine, it's the best and worst place in the same time for all of the players for the pack to be. Each team has one player in each of those arenas and they can never move between them. The pack also can't be carried and it's just hit, so it's all about those precision shots. 
Bonuses of various kinds appear randomly in rooms and whomever grabs them first usually gets a quite a big advantage on the others. This can be anything from freezing other players for a couple of seconds through extra stamina to sealing certain exits among others. There's even 8 player special league tournament mode in which other than playing gamers can actually manage their teams in a limited manner, train their players, reassign positions and deal with injuries. But realistically, if you're going to be investing time in projectile, more often than not it will be quick games against others. As futuristic sports games go, Projectile is complete opposite to Pro Soccer 2190. It's imaginative, unique and fun. Go and get it. Shadow of the Devil is a Slovak dark mystery horror team point and click adventure game in vein of Dark Seed. Or it would like to be at the very least as it seemingly failed on most fronts. You know what, let's play a quick game of what's wrong with my game. I'll go first and I will shout out all its faults and then we'll see if it's worth your time. It only ever came out in Slovak, which is not an issue to an odd 5.5 million population of the country, but literally everyone else all around the world would not be able to comprehend what it's all about. And that's roughly 8 billion people, give or take. Shadow of the Devil is short. How short it is, you may wonder. Well, if you're not gonna get irreversibly stuck, miss an odd object or overlook something crucial, it can be completed roughly in as long as it takes you to prepare a home-cooked dinner, so an hour or a little over. And cooking is definitely better use of your time. But don't worry, language barrier aside, it will not take you an hour, as getting stuck or making a terrible mistake is easy and Shadow of the Devil is chock full of various traps. To make things worse, there's obviously no save game function, because why would there be one, right? I mean, whoever heard of an adventure game with such a fancy and code expensive feature? Oh wait, literally everyone who ever made an adventure game. So you fail, you start again, rinse and repeat, and I don't see that happening. Not to me at least. There's only as much time as you have on Earth, and frankly, I'd rather spend it dumping bucketfuls on Pro Soccer 2190 than repeating the same section in an adventure game time after time knowing very well I'll never manage to complete it anyway. And finally, keeping in mind everything I just said, Shadow of the Devil released in 1996. Two years after Commodore's demise and in probably last or penultimate year any real and decent Amiga games were released commercially on the system. Sadly, it was not worth your money in 1996 and it's not worth your time now. On the plus side, the graphics are excellent and really thematically correct, gory, gruesome and atmospheric. So this could be an amazing title if there was any real game behind those graphics. The end. Fin. Au revoir. Whatever. Xerex is an arcade horizontal scrolling sci-fi team shoot em up and an Amiga exclusive. And as shooters go, it's actually pretty decent. The graphics are really nice and colorful and the sprites are detailed. While the backgrounds are not spectacular in any sense of the word, they are okay and most importantly they do not crash with the foreground. Which is a case for many of those less known bullet spewers out there. So you should not have any issues distinguishing enemy shots or even enemies themselves from it. There are 5 average length levels in the game and each ends with a boss fight. These are all very unique and require a bit different approach to beat but are nowhere near comparable in quality to the best in the genre. Still, plowing through hundreds of enemies and then bosses spraying bullets all around is fun in this one despite that. There's 6 upgrades in the game which you can pick from orbs left by defeated enemies and within those there are some staples of the genre like satellite ships helping you in your fight, backwards shot or even missiles. The balancing of the levels is a bit all over the place and not always the next one is noticeably more demanding than the previous, but that's really not a big issue if you're a fan of shooters. What is a little pain however, at least in my eyes, is the bottom bar of the screen that sits there all the way through the game. It displays the game title and names of coder and graphics designer. I mean, I get that they might have wanted to reduce the gameplay window to keep the game running fluid, but they could have put anything in there. A lady in swimsuit, an alien munching on a human head, picture of a picture of a picture that depicts a picture of a picture. Anything other than this self-serving bullshit. I'm Batman. What the hell? Oh, okay, sorry. Man but telling me to ease up on the curses, so yeah. Syriax is a good game, not great but definitely good. And the issue I have with it is very personal, so if you're not touched in a head the way I am, hunt it down and give it a go cause it's worth it. Zombie Apocalypse 2 is not an ambitious title, it doesn't overwhelm you with its story, it's not bothering you with overly complicated tasks to perform in each stage and it does not require you to give it your full attention. In fact you can play it with one hand eating soup with another. Or fries. I'm in a mood for fries now, dammit. It's a 10-15 minutes kind of a game that capitalizes on popularity of Gorefield titles like Mortal Kombat not offering comparable depth of features. You fire it up when either thinking what other title to invest more time in, to let off some steam mindlessly killing thousands of zombies or when you literally have just few minutes and desperately want to play something. And truth be told, 
it doesn't fail in any of those scenarios. It is however not a game that you'd like to spend the whole afternoon immersing yourself in as there's no meat on the bones here really. Bad pun, I know, let's move on. You pick it up, you shoot some zombies covering the screen with hundreds of rotting body parts and bucketfuls of blood and then you move on to something better. If approached like that you'll have no problem enjoying it in those short occasional bursts. Now, as you can clearly see, it's an Operation Wolf kind of a game, where you control a crosshair exterminating the zombies as they wander about the screen. The left mouse button shoots the gun and right throws the grenades. Both are limited in number, so whenever you see extra supplies falling from the sky, don't hesitate to shoot them as they will restock these. The game is that simple, in each level you get X number of enemies to kill and when you do, it's straight to the next stage. Rinse and repeat and then get bored with it. As someone who quite honestly can't play Operation Wolf or Cabal for too long, as I lose interest in their loop quickly, I'm not loving Zombie Apocalypse 2. It's far more repeatable than the two classics. But I can appreciate it for what it is, which is short mindless fun and nothing more. Zone Warrior is a side-scrolling action shooter platformer with some very basic exploration and gameplay that feels as if it was originally planned for an 8-bit machine like C64 or NES. Or maybe it's just me not appreciating it for what it is. Who knows? Anyway, story-wise, in 30th century, Earth was invaded by the aliens known as Geeks. We're lucky here, guys, because if it was nerds, we'd be done for. But since we've managed to draw them off, no doubt with your help, my dear viewer, because your heroic acts are well known throughout the universe, they decided a different approach was necessary to destroy us. And no, they did not go for flooding the market with mediocre games, driving millions of gamers to ritualistic self-sacrifices. Not the case here whatsoever. They stole a prototype time machine and ventured into different periods of past with a plan to disrupt our technological development so that we would be an easier kill in the future. So, the present from which the story started off. As stupid as alien plans go, it's not the worst. I mean, it didn't consider splitting timelines when things change and creation of alternative parallel timelines either for that matter, but whatever, it's just a game, right? So they went into five periods, prehistoric, Egyptian, medieval, Japanese and future. And while I can understand Egyptian meaning ancient, I have no clue what Japanese is supposed to be here. Each of those timelines slash levels features appropriately themed enemies and hazards and sees you running around killing buddies and saving hostages, like damsels in distress for instance. All that with your trusty weapon that can be upgraded to 3 and 5 way shot or swapped for a flamethrower for a maximum damage output. Each of the levels is quite big actually, consisting of many separate screens interconnected by doors and gates, and to complete them you'll have to find and rescue a certain number of captives, and then defeat the geek commander, which if I wouldn't see the game I could have only imagined as this white shirt tucked in dude with three pencils sticking out of his shirt's chest pocket and a huge steel retainer permanently mounted in his jaw. Anyway, the commander is always hidden behind the key lock door, so you must find the key first to be able to destroy him. Zone Warrior is not bad, but it's not great either. And while it's perfectly completable and the time you invest in it does not feel wasted, I still for whatever the reason can't shake the feeling that it was supposed to be an 8-bit game. And that during development at some point it was dropped and then quickly ported to 16-bit platform changing nothing but graphics. It's not the case obviously, it just feels like that to me. Now, since we've covered few decent or even good games, let's tackle one stinker. And this one's so smelly, your eyes will bleed. Or ears, actually, but we'll circle back to that. Yolanda is interesting not only because it's largely unknown, but also because it released on 8 and 16-bit systems at the same time, differing a bit between them. On smaller machines it was called Hercules and featured, well, him. And on 16-bit machines you play as Yolanda, apparently Hercules' daughter. My best bet here for why the name's different is that on 8-bit systems where character was just few pixels in size, it made no difference how it looked like and more recognizable name, preferably someone known for strength and agility, was more appropriate to lure gamers in. While on big machines they bet on making a protagonist barely clothed big chested blonde and drive the sales based on that. Since Yolanda's featured in this obscure games video, it's clear that even massive boobies cannot save something that is a torture to play. And it is. In theory, Yolanda is a single screen platformer in which you have to get to the exit of each screen ASAP, avoiding all the environmental hazards and various enemies. In theory. In practice, it's a nightmare built on terrible level design, generic bland and boring enemies randomly showing and disappearing platforms requiring you to remember which are which and lackluster gameplay. And if that was not enough, the music is the worst I've heard on the Amiga and perhaps on all systems. It just never stops. It continues drilling a finger-sized hole in your brain with repeatable singer sound or two that just goes on and on and on forever. Numbing you to all the pains and troubles of existence, I mean, just listen. 
After a while, when the hole is big enough that you can stick a big toe in it, you stop caring. You begin to enjoy it, your pain receptors grew accustomed to this initially painful and now calming drum roll of destruction, the experience. Yes, you will go out and start killing everyone, everywhere. Just one more screen. I'm Batman. Wait, what? Oh my god. I, I may have been shitting on you, buddy, for what seems like dozens of videos, and I'm sorry. You literally saved me just now. I, I, I don't know what happened. This game, this abomination. Guys, do not play Yolanda. It's a mind control tool. It's gonna brainwash you. You'll be capable of everything after getting yourself lost in it. I repeat, do not play Yolanda. You know what? I never imagined I might ever have to say it, but Yolanda may be as bad as Pro Soccer 2190 is. Released late in Amiga's life in 1997, The World of Magic is a system-exclusive point-and-click adventure and an average game at best from a technical point of view. But compared to Yolanda, it's a masterpiece. The game is set in magical world of Kawamoon and you play as Grandon, a teenage wizard wannabe. When your home village is raided by goblins and no one comes to the rescue, along with all other villagers that survived, you're forced to flee your home and embark on a quest to find a real wizard who will teach you in the arts of magic. It's been pointed out on Lemon Amiga website in the comments section under this game that it may have been made using a shareware tool called Grail. G-R-I-L-L Grail. Wow, it's a spelling contest video now or what? Anyway, I can believe that there were some publicly available tools used to make it as from a presentation point of view, so graphics and sounds, it's way below what was a standard on the Amiga 3-4 years earlier. You know, presentation is hardly what makes or breaks the game. Fortunately, the gameplay is all there and the world of magic is not bad. If you're a fan of the genre, it's definitely worth tracking and completing, especially that some of the dialogues are just hilarious. In fact, it's chock full of funny, often over-the-top crazy exchanges between the characters and edgy humor. But it definitely shouldn't be anyone's first point-and-click game as it's very rough, unpolished and generally speaking uneven game. For adventure game newbies, personally, I'd recommend something from LucasArts. Anyway, most puzzles are inventory-based and they're not overly demanding and while the game is not a looker, the aforementioned dialogues are really what it's all about, as when you read few of them, you'll want to complete the game just to enjoy the shits and giggles, if nothing else. And you should, as it's not a big time investment and can be completed in about an hour or two at most. Wizard's Castle, but not as in castle belonging to a wizard, but plural, Wizard's Castle, is not only weirdly named, but also terrible Amiga exclusive. I know, I know, we had Yolanda already and I should really spare you, but perhaps by knowing about it, you will save yourself from trying it out on one of those lazy winter evenings. So, let's assume that I'm talking about it for your own good. Or at least I'll stick to that story. Anyway, Wizard's Castle is a flick screen platformer that is just awful. It doesn't look too bad, not especially interesting, true, but not bad in the most obvious meaning of the word. But the sound design of it is nearly as bad as that of Yolanda. I mean, just listen to the sound that the character makes whenever he picks up something. It's the same that he does when he's hit by an enemy. Overall, the game seems to have three, four different sound clips at most and use them for everything. Oh well, let's move on. Starwise, it seems that it was supposed to be a wizard's castle, so castle belonging to a wizard, as you must venture into it, get to the wizard eventually, all the while defeating hundreds of his monsters of various kind. Why would you need to get to him? Nobody knows, and I suppose we won't either, as I've not heard of anyone who actually managed to complete the game, for one reason or another, be it difficulty or overwhelming and quickly setting boredom. But what's even more interesting than the reason for invading of the castle, is why did you decide that appropriate attire for such occasion would be a pair of speedos and nothing else? I mean, what do you expect to find when you get to the wizard? A magical oceanside sandy beach that's trapped in the 80s when people still wore these? Let me know in the comments below. There's no bad answers here. There's no good ones either, but I'm curious despite that. Kingsoft, the publisher of Wizard's Castle, was well known back then for dropping real bad games. And with this one, they did not disappoint. Or they did, depends on your point of view. Oh, and on a side note, the developer was also called Soft Touch, which may be the clue for solving the whole Speedos conundrum here. I don't know if you've ever played a game called Safari Guns. Wildlife is its spiritual successor and also a game that's odd but fun for a short while. There are four locations that you can pick between when starting, America, Arctic, India and Australia, and you're given a task of finding and photographing three rare animals in each. As you go about it, many other different animals would pop on the screen, but your only real goal is to immortalize the given free on film. Nothing more. 
The gameplay is in first person perspective, like Operation Wolf, where you control a crosshair and must use it to take pictures. You can have a switch between the camera and a gun, as you also have to shoot poachers. Now, I get it, I really do. We have to save the endangered species, blah blah blah. But shooting dudes straight up without a word of a warning or even trying to make them see the error of their ways? You're not as much of a hero as I always taken you for. You're cold, man, cold. On the other hand, when I think about it, I get it. You're shooting them not only to protect the animals, but also yourself, as they will open fire at you willingly as well, giving it no thought whatsoever. So, now, as I've mentally and verbally processed what's going on here, I'd like to apologize, I forgive you, and I am once again your as loyal supporter as I've always been. Short of a minute ago when I wasn't. Anyway, you've two cameras to pick from for close and far off shots, the forementioned gun for protection and a hand, with which you can pick up items like additional equipment or medipacks for healing. Sadly, despite being made by the same developer, Wildlife is just not as good as Safari Guns was. The original had simple but still present in the game progression, and in Wildlife, as soon as you manage to grab all the pictures required in a particular stage, you're moved straight back to the area selection screen, which is really anticlimactic. At least the graphics and especially the parallax scrolling is really nice, so that's what the game definitely has going for it. Wildlife is okay for a random 5-10 minutes play once every few years, but I wouldn't keep it at hands reach distance as you're not gonna look for it often. Oh, and the gameplay you're watching is not my own, that's why someone's for whatever the reason just shooting everything. I suppose it could be played like that too, but it's just not the objective of the game, so... You know what we've not seen in a short while? Multidiscipline sports games. You know, ones like those from Epix. They were always fun and could easily as well make or break friendships over something silly like pole vault event or synchronized swimming. Enter Western Games. And yes, you guessed it right, it's a multi-event game where you and a buddy or CPU can compete in six Wild West team categories. First is arm wrestling, which requires very little explanation, just make sure that you win. Then there's beer shooting, which coincidentally is precisely what it's named. So you must shoot five beer glass targets faster than your opponent does. And since you're both intoxicated, crosshair is kinda flowing all over the place and the glasses are held by innocents, so yeah, be careful. Quit spitting is gentleman's sport. I bet this sentence has never been said aloud. Not to this day at least. Basically you'll need to bite a chunk of tobacco, chew it to the right consistency and then spit it out at the correct angle to hit your opponent's speed bucket. Fun. The milking is milking cows, you saw it in the olden movies, so just give it your best and pull on them tea. I should really be careful what I say here, shouldn't I? Dancing is as stupid as in most other games that feature it, but what you must do is perform complicated and carpal tunnel inducing movements of the joystick to follow a dance routine. It's not fun, but I suppose most of these multi-events games had one discipline that was not as good as the others. Finally, there's eating competition and something I actually could participate in in real life. Because bacon is life. Don't quote me on that. So you have to dip the spoon in the stew, raise it up, balancing it not to spill, slurp the stew, chew, swallow, drink and rinse and repeat to completion. Wow, that sounds bad, somehow. I'm leaving it here anyway as Manbad's got enough on his plate and really doesn't need me to add on to it. As weird sports games go, Western games is quite novel, but clunky and incredibly difficult to master controls make it a pain to play most of the time. As it feels that you're competing more with controls than your opponent, really. So approach it if neither of you played it, it's fun then when no one knows what and how to do. It's not very often that we get to see a racing game that tries to lean towards the simulation as opposed to arcade and in the same time presents its action from a top-down view and not from the cockpit. Warm-up is just that. It's a Formula 1 racing simulation wannabe with a very unusual for the genre viewpoint. You can play it in training, single race or whole season. And obviously the last option is the one that's most fun. You get to pick between 8 different cars, varying a bit in stats, especially acceleration and top speed, and you have to compete on 16 based on real life Formula 1 racing tracks in linear order. As you race along those devilishly difficult stages, you'll be able to customize other particularities of your bullet to best suit your playstyle and skill level, so tires, spoilers, damper and steering sensitivity. And you can do it between the races or during in pit stops. Warm-up is quite demanding and often a single mistake can cost you a whole race, so the racing is tense and exciting. Sadly, the graphics are a little below what we'd expect from the Amiga in 1991, but they're not bad enough to detract from playing. It's worth noting though that personally I'd prefer if there was a bit more distinguishable difference between the cars on the track, as they all seem semi after a while. Sounds are quite decent actually, especially the engines, so I'm not gonna complain about those at all. Warm-up is a game that requires a time investment. It's not gonna appeal to racing game lovers straight away as they will first have to learn how to tackle its controls, which at times tend to feel a bit sensitive. This can be adjusted, but the feeling never really goes away until you get used to it. 
but in the same time it rewards smart play rather than all out pedal to the metal approach. So in the long run you'll be much better driver slowing down before the turns rather than trying to keep maximum speed at all times. If it sounds like something for you, then by all means, give it a go, it can be quite fun. Wanted is a tad above average 2008 sci-fi movie with Angelina Jolie and also a western themed vertically scrolling shoot em up on the Amiga. Coincidentally also a tiny bit above average. It may not be as well known or as good as original it is clearly based on so Gunsmoke, but it's definitely not bad for a session or two of cowboy shooting Bonanza. I had to, I know it's a bad pun but I couldn't help myself. Anyway, you play as bounty hunter who's on a trail of four villains, all to bring them to justice and obviously earn their bounties in the process, cause in the wild west nothing is free. Apart from death, death is. Could actually die in dozen of ways. From like a scorpion sting, poisonous plant, heat, random bullet, Indian raiding party arrow. There was a lot of circumstances that could bring your demise at no extra cost. Still, you play wanted for the bounties. You can choose to pursue them in any order you'd like and when all are eventually dealt with, the fifth bounty emerges and he's the last and the final challenge of the game. It's obviously good to shoot random barrels on your way cause everyone who've played any other western team game knows that they always contain pickups. And they do in Wanted too. Quite often they're helpful items like boots for extra speed of movement, rifle for increased shot range, shield for, well, shield, and whatever you might think about it in the heat of the moment, do not pick up the school, as it ends as bad as in most other games where they can be picked up. You're also armed with dynamite, which functions like the bomb in the most other shooters, regardless of their name, and just clears the screen of enemies entirely. Graphics are not bad, but also nothing to impress in any way, and sounds are okay, even if they quickly become repeatable. Can't complain about it though, as you can't really expect much more from the shooter, right? Despite not having an official port to the Amiga, Gunsmoke is Wanted's biggest problem, because it exists and comparisons between the two are unavoidable. If there was no original, Wanted could have easily been more popular and well known, as it's a decent playing and looking title that the only real issue I might have with is its difficulty, which is definitely not what you'd call demanding. The third career is a spy thrill adventure game and while it was released by Accolade in 1990, a very well known at the time publisher, it is virtually unknown game that not many even heard of. It may be because it's a bit all over the place, but we will get back to that in a minute. You play as an American spy in Germany during Cold War era on a mission to recover stolen NATO defense plants. So as the game settings go, this one's actually interesting, I mean who wouldn't like to be a spy, right? Shoot the bodies, get the girl, travel in obscenely expensive cars, what a life. After creating your character in a pretty in-depth for the time editor you start in your Berlin apartment with just a passport, a little bit of money and a bugging equipment. From this point onward it's all up to you to figure everything out in this entirely menu driven adventure. So you'll be travelling around the city on foot using taxis or even the metro system and seeking out clues to solve the case of missing dogs. You won't get much help from the game itself and that's probably why it never gained any real traction from gamers. It feels sometimes as if you're just wandering aimlessly trying to stumble upon something interesting or pushing the story forwards. And that's not the best way to have your adventure play out if you ask me. So I'll give you a couple of pointers to help on your sadly unpolished adventure. Make sure to check your email and read everything that there is in your spy PC when you start. Pick up everything that's not nailed down whenever you can cause you never know what can come in handy and when. Stock up on useful tools like Photofax or Lockpicks in the mission support as they will come in handy more often than you believe that they might. And finally, do not pick up fights with random characters, especially beggars, cause they're surprisingly tough for someone so malnourished. Despite you being supposedly a super spy, there are a lot to handle and in most of the fights you won't even be able to use your gun. Why do you carry it then, you may wonder? It's a spine thing, if you keep it in your left pocket it's just the right weight to straighten you up as you walk. I think, it's actually not set anywhere in the game. All in all, the third career is based on the premise that had all the makings of a very fun game and it ended up being just a bit below average. If you're a hardcore fan of adventure titles, definitely check it out, but if you're not, it's best to avoid it, not much for you to look for here. Thunderbirds is a bit of an outlier because it's a largely misunderstood game. Among many other systems, it released on the Amiga and I suppose 16-bit machine owners expected a 16-bit experience, when in fact Thunderbirds seemed to have a lot of its design philosophies, roots if you will, based in 8-bit design. So while it looked decent, it didn't offer a tutorial of any kind or any real explanation of how, where and what to do, and just dropped you in the proverbial deep water. Although one mission actually sees you working in the submarine, so it's not that proverbial. Anyway, Thunderbirds is a mixture of side view adventure, arcade and puzzling experiences. There's four missions in the game and for each you assigned a two man team with which you have to pick two items that will help you to complete it. These are saving a man in a flooded mine, 
shutting down a reactor of a damaged nuclear submarine, stealing a super-secret Thunderbirds arch-villain's plants, and thwarting the plot to launch H-bomb missiles. It's easy to pick the wrong items for this, so expect to repeat each a couple of times until you figure out what to take and how to solve its puzzles. They're pretty fun if you're willing to excuse games' vagueness and the fact that you'll need to repeat things few times to really understand them. All the while doing that, you have to make sure not to befall upon games' various dangers and hazards, like radiation poisoning or falling rocks to name a few. Thunderbirds' graphics are nicely detailed for 1989 and the controls, while not the most well thought out, are not overly complicated. And overall, if you like classic adventure puzzle games that are not mouse or text parcel driven and more on a shorter side with some arcade elements to keep you entertained, it's not a bad game to try out. We spoke about Thunderbirds, now it's Thundercats. So next gotta be Thunder Donkeys, right? Or even Thunderbat, man. So like Batman, but plural, and with the power of thunder. Or pocketfuls of triple A buttons, it's not the same. You know how these superhero genesis things go. Thundercats, however, is a side scrolling action slasher shooter platformer, gameplay wise, not unlike Ghosts and Goblins. Totally different in this team, though. Your goal is to complete all levels, defeating the forces of Thundercats' villain, Bam Ra. And these can be various different kinds of creatures, from bats to dwarves, all the way to the half man, half animal thingies, which are difficult for me to explain. Maybe it's a dog, maybe a wolf, perhaps a beaver, who knows? Something with a long mouth, sharp fangs, claws, and death in its eyes. All because I've not seen a single episode of Thundercats, so no mention nothing of its lore. That knowledge, however, is completely unnecessary to complete the game, so if you haven't watched it either, don't let it stop you from playing. And for what it's worth, there's a lot more thunder, so action in this one than in the previous Thundercats. Even the name is better if you think about it. I mean, would you prefer to be called a Thundercat or a Thunderbird? Come to think of it, it's probably best to pick neither. Anyway, you start with a sword, but as the game progresses, you'll be able to upgrade it and eventually even get shots. That, as their characteristic would imply, can be used at a distance, which is always good. If I had to guess when Thundercats were released by its graphics, I'd say it was 1988, and I'd be dead on. But since I knew that beforehand, it's a moot point. But look at it, it does look 1988, doesn't it? Soundwise, it's pretty crap. At least in my books. Not only Yolanda level that we've spoke about in the last video, cause nothing is, but that nonetheless. And the gameplay, while not very demanding and creative, is actually pretty. You thought that I'm gonna say fun, didn't you? Come on, you can tell me. Do it. In the comments below. Let's see if you really did. So anyway, the gameplay is not great. Well, technically it's not broken in any way, it's so boring. All you do is run and shoot, there's not much variety, nothing that would feel at the very least a little special. It's another 8-bit game in early 16-bit games clothing. A victim to cross-genre design that should be left on 8-bit micros with a successor released on new 16-bit machines. It never had one, so we're stuck with this. If the gameplay looks like something worth your time, however by all means give it a go, but if you value your time there are far better games even in this video. Tiger Road is a patch of hair going from your private parts all the way to your belly button. If you're a hairy dude, that is. And only when it's half grey, half your natural hair color. Now, don't look it up. I 100% did not make it up. It's 100% true confirmed. Just trust me. And don't waste your time checking. It's definitely factually correct. You googled it, didn't you? And why did you have to do that? Now you've made one of us feel silly and effectively a liar. That's a strike one. And despite how good looking, smart and generally speaking stand up person you are, three strikes and you're out. But man, know that they did fact check me when instructed not to and that the punishment is a strike. Please and thank you. What? No, it's irrelevant if I was not telling the truth. I mean, they should trust me, right? I'm like TV. If it's in a video format, it's gonna be true. Oh, what was that? Nothing. Batman just wanted some extra cookies. It was not about you. Uh, don't worry about it. Anyway, Tiger Road is also 1989's aggressively average Amiga side-scrolling fantasy themed beat-em-up ported from the Capcom's arcade original. You play as Lee Wong and your mission is to rescue kidnapped children from the evil Ryu, Ken, Oh, which coincidentally is also what Street Fighter's Chan Li screamed during her first threesome. No wonder this is going to stay a small channel, I mean comments like that will get me instantly demonetized. And yet, I cannot help myself. Go figure. Anyway, the game's set in China and you're plowing through what feels like thousands of one-hit buddies going through side-scrolling thematically correct environments to eventually get to the villain himself. Once again, Ryu, Ken, Oh. As you defeat them, you earn points, sometimes weapons and power-ups too. Graphically, Amiga's outing is as close to the arcade as it was possible the year it was released in and sounds are appropriately arcadey too. The gameplay, however, did not suffer at all. But I don't mean that it's great. I mean that it's exactly as simple and uninspired as it was in the Cornup original. So, congratulations, I suppose. 
Tiger Out is not a bad game. Really, it's just so repetitive and similar to dozens of, let's be honest here, better games that it never really crossed the invisible border between being average and good. And it will stay there in the dead center middle of it forever. Tanks is a difficult game to judge. All because it's 2023. Well, when you're watching it by accidentally stumbling onto this channel, it's probably more like 2031 or something given YouTube's algorithm. But whatever, my point stands besides that. Why? Well, when it released, Tanks clearly, based and expanded upon original arcade Tanks, was hella fun. I mean, I would have spent whole afternoons with a body of men shooting each other and drinking be juices, drinking juice boxes. I mean, you get to preset various environmental conditions like the type of landscape, strength of the wind and gravity, what kinds of objects could spawn on the game field. It was fun. And enough to keep the two young teenagers entertained for hours. We would battle each other, keep stats of wins and losses, great times. Until 1993, that is, when Scorched Tanks released and made Tanks obsolete from the day that we first laid out eyes on it. It was so good, in fact, that I wouldn't consider it a step up, a Tanks 2.0. No, it was like Tanks Extreme Edition Super Turbo Alpha++ version 3.71c. It was so good. But it's also not the subject of this video, not an obscure game in any sense of the word, and in itself also was defrauded a year or two later by Worms. So, yeah, Tanks. It's a two-player tank shootout that you can play against a friend or CPU, where you have to aim your shots, choose power keeping in mind earlier mentioned conditions and shoot. And if you did not destroy your opponent, then it's his hair slash turn to do so. Rinse and repeat until one of you fails. The concept is incredibly simple, the mechanics are something my cat could probably master after 10 minutes of randomly hitting a keyboard with his paws, but it was also great fun. And for that, I will remember it, even if today, in 2023, I see no reason at all to ever come back to it, when there's so many, so much better games out there. Targan is a side-scrolling action-adventure hack and slasher. Explosive combo, isn't it? And get this, the villain, the arch enemy you have to find and defeat going through countless screens to get to him is no other than the... I would have inserted a drum roll here, but you know, by I, I mean that Batman would have to do it and he's usually not keen on doing more than the bare minimum, so if you hear me instead of drums, means that he didn't bother. Unless... Nope, still nothing. I'm like 95% sure of it. Let me know how it ended up being, cause while you get to watch this, I will be working on the next one. Editing and uploading is his thing now, really. Oh, I forgot to tell you who the villain is. It's the evil one. Yep, the one and only. Not the good one, not a bit nasty or even the smelly one. It's the evil one himself. Creativity at world class level here, guys. Anyway, despite the incredibly well thought out main enemy, wink wink notch notch, Targan itself is actually a pretty fun game. There's over 40 different enemies to mouth through, from warriors through goblins to demons and anything in between. The game is built out of 120 locations in 5 worlds of forest, underground, tree houses, desert and castle, and you need to traverse them all to eventually get to the you know who. Now, you may assume here that Targan is going to be as mindless of a romp as Tiger Road, but it's anything but. All fights are quite technical, if you can call them that, and while the game is challenging, it's not impossible to beat. Even though you can only use a sword for basic combat, you get to find pick up various glaives that can be used as thrown weapons. Targan's graphics are excellent. I mean, sure, there are sections here and there, and by that I mean mainly in caverns that are not very flashy when it comes to the backgrounds, but most of the time the presentation is stunning. At least for 1989 when it released. While there's no music during gameplay, the sounds are team appropriate with all the cuts, metal clangs, grunts and shouts. Good stuff. And if there's one thing I really don't like about it, it's the animation of basically any character on the screen. That looks as if it could use another 2-3 frames for each move to be fluid. If you enjoyed action-adventure games, Targan's excellent. Is Tearaway Thomas Amiga's answer to Sonic as some Max touted years ago? Well, why don't you make up your own mind about it as I tell you what it is, other than potentially that. Tearaway Thomas is incredibly fast action platformer and an Amiga exclusive, probably too fast for its own good, as if it happened to lend in players like myself libraries, I would have quickly dismissed it, as I was never very keen on those Sonic-like platformers where you don't really complete the levels but breeze through them barely seeing anything. I mean, I'd play and sometimes even complete them, but if I had anything else I wanted to play, this would usually land in the back of the pile with all the discs I didn't care much for. But that's me, and most Amiga gamers who would have had the chance to play it would probably enjoy it a lot. It's composed out of 50 levels divided into 5 differently themed worlds of 10 each, and additional bonus stages. Your goal in each level is that simple, collect a certain number of gems and get to the exit as fast as possible, fighting against constantly ticking down time limit. If that was all, TT would be quite simple. So as you've no doubt noticed already, there are various bodies in each level. 
while they're not there to kill you per se, their task is to stun and slow you down, costing you precious seconds of the timer. And it's a pretty interesting choice if I say so myself, losing life only when you run out of time and not on contact with the enemy. It's a mechanic I can actually get behind in a game as fast as this one. While obviously each second is crucial, at the very least I'm not going to run in constant fear of hitting something and dying instantly. Oh, did I mention that there are numerous hidden rooms or even transporters moving you to new areas full of gems? Because there are. Sure, there may not be as many of them as in likes of Super Frog or Fury of the Faris, but those were entirely different kinds of platformers. Traditional ones. Titi's graphics are pretty nice. They're not overly detailed or flashy, as that would no doubt impede the speed, but they're at least colorful and nicely animated. Sounds are appropriate, and the music tunes well fit fast-paced crazy gameplay. If all you've heard seems like a title you could try and like, give it a go. Because why not? Super is a static screen top-down space shooter. In fact, judging by the background star's animation that clearly moves the wrong way, the game feels as if you were flying backwards shooting at the enemies chasing you. Which in itself wouldn't be such a bad idea for a shooter mechanic, but it's not the case here, so... Anyway, Super is a very early Amiga game and it shows. The graphics are very simple, not better than what you could find in some of the late 8-bit games, and the gameplay mechanics is incredibly basic. Frankly speaking, it's another of those uninspired Galaxian clones, and while the original was really popular some years earlier and filled up arcades all over the world, in 1987, at home, a cheap knockoff was not as captivating. Especially that as the time passed and gamers got a chance to experience other more robust and advanced kinds of games, they did not seek as simple mechanics as the classics offered anymore. They were hungry for flashy titles, with beautiful presentation, new gameplay ideas, lots of add-ons and upgrades, and novelty as you progressed through the game. And none of that is present in the Super. Story-wise, cause of course there's a story, why wouldn't there be one? It is, after all, so much more important than gameplay. You have to transport the vaccine from Earth to the space station that the epidemic broke out on, and fight through hordes of aliens along the way. They, for whatever the reason, don't want you to complete your delivery. It's not stated why, so I'm just gonna assume that it's just because. As in most shooters, however, story is unimportant, it's gameplay that makes or breaks the game, and while Super offers both shooting and meteor dodging levels, and whomever saw my deluxe Gallagher review knows how I love this, other than that, Super serves nothing new or interesting. If you have literally any other shooter on the Amiga, play that over Super. Super Taekwondo Master is what they called me in high school. Short of Super, Taekwondo and Master. But I did attend a karate classes for a year in primary school. It was incredibly boring and required a lot of movement, so a year was as much as I could handle it. That said, I did manage to secure an orange belt, so ever since then I represented it as if I had at least two black ones. And one of them was with stats, cause I was a bad boy. At least in my head. Anyway, Super Taekwondo Master seems to be the game made by folks who had similar upbringing and big aspirations. It features six digitized fighters, each representing their own unique and close-to-life fighting style, not just Taekwondo. Meaning you won't find any explosive specials or unrealistic fatalities in the game. So you know, half of what made Mortal Kombat fun. It does make up for it, with a bit more technical gameplay having all fighters use different fighting style and completely different set of basic and special moves. There's no blood and gore though, so another thing that made Mortal Kombat fun is gone too. Super Taekwondo Master at best is half of the game that Famous Fighter was. At best. And worst of all, I'm not done dissing it. For one, the animations seem to have just a frame or two too few for each of the moves to feel fluid. Then there are backgrounds, which not only are fugly, with very contrasty color schemes that clash with the fighters badly, but there's only like three or four of these stops, so they repeat all the freaking time. Given their quality though, it's probably for the best. So having realized that, I'd like to officially retract my comment about them. But man, edit this whole segment out not to include it, please buddy. And there is a small matter of speed. Super Taekwondo Master's speed is directly tied to your machine's power. So if you have an A1200 with some fast RAM or any Amigo with a turbo card, really the game will be nigh unplayable running at cartoon-like speeds. Finally, there is an elephant in the room, so digitized characters, which are not bad per se, but they're not great either. Main reason being a very limited color palette used for them making them look blunt and washed out. If you manage to overlook all that, however, and just focus on gameplay itself, then this Polish attempt at Mortal Kombat is not terrible. And while playing with CPU is not very exciting, having a go at it with a friend or even up to 5 of this in tournament mode can actually be quite fun. The most recent comment under Superman, the Man of Steel on Lemon Amiga website simply says, one word, avoid. And I could pretty much end this preview here as it's just on point. You should avoid it as it offers as much fun as drinking a bottle of wiper fluid might. So yeah, technically it's alcohol, or game in this case, but you're not gonna enjoy it either. But if you insist on learning what it is, I'll tell you. I'll do it just for you. 
but don't tell me later I didn't warn you if you're not gonna like it. So, Superman, the Man of Steel. Imagine in famous Nintendo 64 Superman. It was bad, right? Some even call it one of the worst games in existence. Okay, now imagine the graphics are not 3D but 2D and the Amiga Superman is as bad and equally unplayable. Even more so, it has three different game modes, one similar to that on N64, from behind the back but with shooting, one overhead vertical scrolling and last side scrolling. All these are linked with comic book panels telling the game's story. If this description seems a bit vague, it's because I've never managed to complete the first mode even. The from behind the back flying is just a nightmare. I honestly don't know what to do to do well in it. And it's irritating because there's no useful indicators helping in figuring it out. Sure, chances are they may have been in the manual, but today I have no access to the original, nor the manual, so... Let it be clear then that most of what you'll hear will be based on what I found online. Superman can punch, he can kick, oh how he can kick indeed. He has a super breath and a heat vision. And all these have their own separate meters. Because combining them into one and calling it, let's say, stamina, or super stamina for a little in-team flair, would be difficult, right? And would require more code writing to keep one counter instead of four, right? Well, I'm no programmer, but one seems like less than four to me. Anyway, for what it's worth, the eight game section Superman Man of Steel is built out of sound fun in theory. Like something that he might actually do in the comics. In the first section, Superman on the way to Star Labs encounters Darkseid's army and he has to take him out using his powers. Now, from my experience it's impossible, but let's carry on. And just assume that I'm a crappy gamer, which is not out of question here. In second side view section you're saving Lois and Governor Lee who are held hostage on ship called the Atlantis. In third, this time top-down section, Superman's escorting shuttle that the Professor Gorwin's on to Star Labs star satellite avoiding kryptonite space debris. In fourth, you're a... You know what? I'm not gonna list them all. If you feel that you can overcome dodgy controls, unsatisfying and confusing gameplay, then perhaps give it a go yourself. Make sure to let me know in the comments if you do, because I'm curious how someone who actually completed it feels about it. Are you the smartest person in every room? Of course you are. I know you. You definitely are. I'd even stretch it slightly by saying that you're the smartest person on planet right now. I'm not exaggerating. I never said in the universe. Because, you know, Rick Sanchez may give you run for your money, but he's off planet at the moment on a super important mission of intergalactic importance. He's been jealous of me having my own Batman here, and he's looking for a space Batman. Half man, half space bat, or something. The bottom half is man, apparently. Anyway, since you're such a brainiac, I bet you love trivia, right? I'm sure that no questions in Trivial Pursuit are a challenge for you now, so that's why I've got a different game for you today. One that's aptly named too. Power Play, the game of gods, for up to four players. You play as one of four mythological Greek gods, Apollo, Hermes, Hecate or Aphrodite, and you choose a team of four warriors to represent you in Power Play Tournament. A battle for the biggest brain in the heavens played on a chess-like board. I know, you've never expected a trivia game to have a story, but here you go, there's always a first. The square fields on board are divided into four colors, representing a particular subject area. Each question has four possible answers, and if you answer correctly, you earn so-called wisdom points, and can move one of your warriors one square in any direction. When you accumulate 25 wisdom points, you are allowed to promote one of your warriors into a higher level. When two opposing teams' warriors enter the same square, a trivia-style challenge ensues, with quickfire-like questions, and whomever answers more of them first correctly gets the points. If you answer wrong though, you lose them, so that's worth keeping in mind. A loser of such brain bout has one of his warrior's skill level lowered. Oh, and to be clear, the higher the level of the warrior, the more difficult it is to beat in a challenge, but it also has to answer more demanding questions in the non-challenge trivia. Don't focus on just one warrior though, as pieces left aside and ignored after a while may move on their own accord, and not necessarily into the category you strong at. Powerplay originally came out on 64 where it was a huge hit. On Amiga, it not only never reached the similar heights of popularity, but never really gained any acclaim and was largely ignored and dead on arrival title. Which is odd, as it's pretty fun in multiplayer, provided all parties playing it like trivia. Archipelagos takes place in the future, long after we've poisoned the Earth to the point that the polar caps melted, covering most of the planet with water, leaving only remote lonely islands of decaying land masses known as archipelagos. So keep all that in mind next time you forget to sort your trash before throwing it out. Since the future was doomed, humanity decided to quickly build machines to clean the remaining surface and prepare for repopulation. These were supplemented by genetically altered plants designed to live off of pollution and help in its fast processing. And as most things that are done fast and not careful, both of these failed. 
machines turned into radiation generators and plants became hostile. So, since the autonomous machines couldn't be trusted anymore, you're picked to be the one who's our last chance of survival. Who has to clean the islands one by one? You do so by disabling radiation generators on each of the islands, so you have to destroy numerous power generators supplying this with power first, and then get back to the radiation generator racing against counting down clock to turn it off before it melts down. There are a few different kinds of enemies that will try to stop you from so-called necromancers, spheres spreading pollution all around, from mutated trees polluting the ground they grow on, to eco eggs and air cleaners. First explode in toxic flame upon contact, second actually do clean the air but out of literally everything, living organisms included, such as yourself, for instance. Despite all I just said and what you see on your screen scrolling smoothly in first-person perspective, Archipelagos is not really an arcade title, but a puzzler that will require use of your grey mask as much as of your joystick control skills. Or mouse, I should say, really, as it's controlled with a rodent. So you won't only eradicate the pollutants, but will have to help in rebuilding the ecosystem too. The game consists of 10,000 islands, yes, you heard that right, so completing them all will be nigh impossible. Not only because the difficulty ramps up quite quickly, but also because of how much time it takes to beat those later levels. But if you're up for it, it will be fun. At least until you get bored or tired with doing the same thing for literally thousands of times. I've used literally twice, well now thrice, in one preview. Batman will be pissed, as he's sort of a grammar police around here. Janosik, or how he's originally called in Poland Janosik, was a fantasy historical folk hero. Basically Polish slash Czech Robin Hood, if you will. So he was a Carpathian Mountains Highlander who stole from rich and gave to the poor, and also had his wealthy noble arch nemesis, Baron Herbert. Same same but different, you know? Janosik the game originally came out on 8-bit Atari microcomputers and then was converted to the Amiga, polishing the presentation slightly, with an accent on slightly. Other than that though, it's still a simple 8-bit game in its gameplay design. Story-wise, forementioned evil Baron Herbert hearing about Janosik helping oppressed peasants in revenge captured Marina, Janosik's beloved, and imprisoned her in his castle hoping to lure him into a trap. As evil plans go, this one's not that bad and it was partly successful, as Janosik in your capable hands set off to save his love. What he did not predict though is that you'll be the one controlling the folk hero, and with you leading him, he can't and won't fail. You start armed with just a small one-hand axe, but as you go through the game you'll be able to find and use other items. Not weapons, though. The game is divided into three worlds of forest, village and castle, and you'll need to battle your way through hundreds of baron's goons and other random enemies like bears to complete it. Why would bears be against you? I don't know. But it is what it is. Game logic is the culprit, I suppose. Now, as I said all that, let me clarify something. Janosik, same as many very late conversions from 8-bit systems to Amiga, is dog shit quite literally. From the moment you put the disc into the drive and run the game, a very specific odor will emerge and start spreading in your game room. It's very intensive and will make your eyes burn. First of all, graphics are pretty bad. Many of the backgrounds are walls of black, sprites have maybe one or two frames of animation for walking at most, and generally speaking, it just looks awful. There is no deaf animations to speak of, so the enemy that you kill just disappears, instantly, as if it was never there, the controls are clunky and your attack looks as if Janosik was practicing one of those Fortnite dances rather than trying to actively hurt the enemy. It's terrible. So unless you like really bad games, avoid this one if you can. Joe Blade is another game that landed on the Amiga after being ported from an 8-bit source. Even more so, after being moderately successful on MSX in 1986, it moved to all other popular 8-bit machines and released there as a budget title. And this Amiga version is basically that budget release with upgraded graphics and sounds. It could be argued that budget release 8-bit port was not needed on an Amiga in 1988 and that it had to be a terrible game, but it actually wasn't. I loved it on my C64 and on Amiga it was as good. That said, as good was not enough. 16-bit gamers required, no, craved 16-bit quality. And not only in presentation, but also in game design. And Joe Blade was all out 8-bit in how it played. It's not bad per se, it's just not what we were after on our shiny and powerful new systems. The game takes place during World War II and places you in shoes of the titular tough guy, Joe Blade. And these are very tiny shoes carrying a huge head. Joe Blade is a side view flick scrolling shooter adventure mixture in which you have to shoot the bad guys as much as you need to solve some minor puzzles. You'll pick up items like cell keys, enemy uniforms and extra ammo and they will be really helpful on your mission. What mission, you may wonder? 
Well, a villain known only as Krug's Bloodfinger has captured and imprisoned six world leaders and each of them is held for ransom in a different location around his swarming with buddies base. So, your mission, if you choose to accept it and load the game up, is to free all six captives and destroy Bloodfinger's hideout. So you will search for the leaders in different parts of the complex and also activate bombs to destroy it when you're done. They are timed and leave you with exactly 20 minutes to do it all, so yeah, your math is correct, it's a 20 minute game. But not really. Because if you decide to give Joe Blade a chance, don't pick up items that look like a large hand grenades too early. As these are set bombs and solving their puzzle will start the 20 minute time. It's best to save at least a couple of the hostages before you touch your first bomb. Oh, and if you fail the bomb puzzle, the game will end then and there. So there's that. Personally, I'm not a fan of 16-bit Joe Blade, because I know what Amiga is really capable of. But on C64, it was a blast. Bad pun intended. Uraiski Sen, which loosely translates to Jurassic Dream, and I'll call it that for the rest of this preview, is a late Polish Amiga platformer, similar in presentation and gameplay look to much earlier and also better prehistoric. The background story is portrayed by a short comic-like intro that sadly is only in Polish, but roughly depicts our hero in a cinema watching Jurassic Dream, the latest blockbuster, and loving it. Afterwards, he comes back home, plays video game for a little while, and goes to bed eventually. While dreaming, he's transferred mysteriously into prehistoric times where he must survive and find a way to get back home to our times. To do so, you must find the magical ancient talisman that is the key to going back to the future. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. I'm Batman! Yeah, you're right, it's the best time travel movie, Bruce. Jurassic Dream is as typical of a platformer as they come. You're completing the levels going from left to right, defeating hundreds upon hundreds of various thematically correct and completely out of place enemies alike, and collecting energy and points. While the graphics are really nice, with large detailed sprites and colorful backgrounds, the animations are rather disappointing, looking as if they were quickly put together from two or three frames at most, in a rush just to push the game on the shelves. Which may have been the case as it came out in 1995, when Commodore was officially long gone and Amiga was on its way out too, slowly giving away numbers to steadily growing PC and consoles user base. Additionally, there's no scrolling, the screens flick between each other and the controls are very loose for the lack of a better word, making Jurassic Dream feel very 8-bit despite clearly using 16-bit presentation. Now, don't get me wrong, it's nowhere near as bad as Janosik we've spoke about just a few minutes ago, but it's definitely below average for the Amiga, and given the really good graphics, it's also an opportunity wasted for a fun and playable release. As we go through many games for the series, you've probably noticed that between 1995 and 1997, Polish devs kept releasing games on the Amiga more than anyone else. Sadly, most of them were either pretty bad or average at best. Jurassic Dreams falls somewhere in between. It's probably because the country was not as wealthy as its neighbors were and cheap and easily accessible Amiga was still a viable option for the main gaming machine in many households before they all moved to much more expensive PCs eventually over the next few years. In the end, Jurassic Dream is definitely a game fans of platformers should own and complete, but everyone else can pretty much skip it. Alright, since we've talked about few average games, why don't we cover one that's actually really good? What do you say? I knew you'd be into it. So, Jupiter's Master Drive is a top-down arcade racer with shooting. Fun, right? The races take place on Jupiter and its moons that all have been long colonized in the far off future. Each race is three laps in a different location and in various conditions and features just three cars. And if you think that three cars is not a lot, it's plenty enough for this fun racer. Trust me. There are various power-ups, some that are collectible like weapons and others that are incorporated into the track itself, like shortcuts and speed boosting paths. These last often don't follow the usual track layout and can move you ahead quite considerably. The game can be played in single races, which are quick and fun, or in much more immersive and involving full season mode. It will see you going through various action-packed league races and even out of the league time bonus money earning duels on enclosed arenas. Money collected in standard and bonus races can be used to soup up your car, and there's quite a few of these upgrades actually. You can work on engine, turbo, brakes, fuel tank, armor and cannon. Graphics, while not world shattering, are pretty clean and overall nice, but most importantly very very fast and super smooth scrolling. So racing in Jupiter's Master Drive alone in season, or with a friend in split screen mode, is a pure pleasure both to behold and to actually play. If I had to rate the best Amiga's top-down racers, I'd place Jupiter's Master Drive comfortably somewhere between the very best out there so Supercars 2 and nearly as good Nitro. If you like top-down racers, this little-known gem will definitely be a highlight of your collection, as it's not only rare but also very very fun. And that can't be said about all obscure games, sadly. 
Despite what it may sound like, Kelly X is not the name of an adult actress, but a first-person perspective space shooter on the Amiga. I mean, it could very well be a name of an actress, or a performer I should say really, but I have no way of confirming or denying that without googling, and I really don't need those kinds of suggestions in my search results from today onward to pop out anytime I try to access Twitter. I mean X. While it looks like Kelly X took the flight controls and shooting straight from the Elite, nothing else is similar between the two titles, and it was never the shooting that made Elite such a well-known and beloved game. Anyway, in Kelly X you fly for the so-called Peace Foundation, a futuristic militaristic version of Greenpeace. Your task is to seek out rogue space stations that illegally dump nuclear waste and destroy the radioactive material canisters as well as Guardian fighters protecting those. Your ship moves forward automatically on its own and you cannot stop it. You can however speed it up or slow it down. Steering is either with a joystick or a mouse and neither is perfect, with their own ups and downsides. Getting shot or colliding with enemies depletes your shields the same way hyperspace jumps do. And when it's all gone, it's a game over. So keep an eye on it. Also, set jumps drop you in a random location, so don't overuse them. It's not worth it. You're armed with a laser and there are no upgrades to it, so the progression feels very horizontal. Doing the same thing over and over never really lets you feel like you've achieved anything noteworthy. And that's the main issue with Kali X, that it's repetitive and, well, boring really. So unless you absolutely love the first person shooters and have to sample them all, it's not worth more of your time than two free plays at best. The Keys to Maramon originally released on PC, and then a year later was ported to C64 and Amiga, and today's version that we'll look at is the best out of them all. It's a real-time action role-playing, combat-wise similar to Times of Lore and feeling like an early draft for 1996 Diablo, all because it's action-packed, rather simple as compared to other RPGs of the time, and takes place in and around a single location, the titular town of Maramon. I think however that it's all by design, to appeal to people unfamiliar with the genre, to lure them in and get them used to it, so that they could later on try out and fall in love with bigger RPGs of the early 90s. It's a far-fetched assumption I know, given that I have nothing, no details or gossip to base it on, it's just how I feel. And especially that there's virtually no reason for one developer to make a game that would spark up interest in games by other devs. That would just be silly and a bad business practice, whichever way you want to look at it. So yeah. Anyway, the Keys to Maramon is set in the same world as developers' earlier Magic Candle games and uses their modified engine too. Meaning graphics and animation are not its strongest suits. And it shows, the sprites are rather small and poorly animated and fighting bodies looks and feels like literally just walking into them. So in a way, you're stomping them down. Or, as it looks more like it really, challenging them to the dancing duels and winning them all by sturdy dancing enemies into oblivion. Still, what I'm trying to say here is that the presentation is a little disappointing. But if you think I'm done dumping on the game already, you're wrong, because it also has sounds. Or beeps and boops, I should say really. They feel as if they were directly moved from PC speaker to the Amiga not using any of the system's capabilities and replacing all in-game sounds with generic broken Pac-Man-like sound files. It's painful to listen if you have nothing else running in the background. All that said, despite what it may sound like, I don't dislike the game. Quite the opposite, in fact. It's fun for what it is, and having to read the city of monsters attacking it at night, in the same time trying to figure out the mystery of the four towers hovering above it, is hella fun. Kid Gloves 2 The Journey Back is an adventure platformer and not really a sequel to the first game. I mean, they're both platformers, but other than that, they're nothing alike. And it's because Kid Gloves 2 was originally developed as Little Bow, before being purchased by Millennium and released as a sequel to the earlier, equally as obscure game. If you give it time and play it a little, it feels more like Super Wonder Boy rather than anything else. Story-wise, an evil wizard known only as Wyvel Art kidnapped your girlfriend and you being the loving and courageous boyfriend that you are, instead of going to the fantasy police, hiring a group adventurers to track him down, or pleading for help with medieval Batman, decides to grab a butter knife, put on the best makeup you can and go for the wizard. And yeah, I said makeup. Just look at that lipstick on the little fellow running around the screen. He's sporting it like a champ. The game is divided into 6 worlds and these in turn into 4 levels each, for a total of 24 stages to beat. There are obviously dozens of different enemies that will cross your path that for whatever the reason took the wizard's sight and they will have to be disposed of. Fortunately, for the most part, they're not very demanding, so shouldn't pose too much of a challenge to a seasoned warrior such as yourself. Some environmental traps are also part of the design of Kids Gloves as World 2, so if you'll just be wary of anything that looks dangerous and assume that everything is a trap that might kill you and should be avoided, then you should be fine. 
Most of them telegraph themselves quite obviously though, so shouldn't really surprise you on your travels. Defeated enemies unless scripted for a particular drop behavior, like the first one in level 2 for instance, leave random items behind. And they can be new weapons, collectible objects, magic spells and such, so certain replayability factor is definitely present in the game. Especially that Kid Gloves 2 features many hidden bonus areas that often require a little bit of joystick gymnastics to get to. End of level bosses, while not overly difficult, are quite fun too and add to the overall atmosphere. I remember some magazines back in the day complaining that the game was very generic and did nothing new. And that's not a far-fetched judgement, and it's factually correct. But while it does same things other titles did before, it does all of them quite well. And if you're not gonna hold the lack of genuine innovation against it, you won't be disappointed playing Kid Gloves 2. Night Force is a flip screen side view fantasy beat em up. Well, more hack and slash than beat em up, really, but you know, potato potato, tomato tomato, ketchup tomato sauce. The evil wizard Red Sabbath, cause Green Sabbath was on holiday and was not as evil, conquered the land of Beloth and kidnapped the princess ruling it. Frankly speaking, there was a king there too, but he died, so. Anyway, Beloth is not your usual kingdom. It's a mythical place where many different time periods cross, a place torn out of time, if you will. As per usual, when evil emerges and there's no one strong or brave enough to face it, you're the one to take it upon yourself to clean the land of it. So you need to complete 5 levels, each corresponding to a different time period. Defeat the evil wizard clone, defending each of them, and collect 7 magical talismans held by wizard's minions. Each of those talismans brings advantages to you on your quest, but they only work in appropriate time periods that they belong to. And these don't have to be the same period they've been found in. But since you can jump between the levels after getting an interesting amulet that would work in another, you can move to it and take advantage of it. You will face a lot of different enemies, thematically different depending on the time period that you'll be in, and they can be anything from goblin-like creatures through trolls, bubbles and birds, yes, you heard that right, all the way to robot-like enemies and bouncing springs in the future period. It's an odd mixture that feels as interesting as it feels out of place from time to time. The graphics, especially the large detailed backgrounds and all sprites are excellent for 1989 and the definite highlight of the presentation. But the combat and jumping animations are just atrocious, to the point that I can't imagine myself playing Night Force today. It's just not happening. The game is jumpy, shaky and generally speaking unpleasant to play. If that wasn't enough, you're never really feeling like you're in a full control of what you're doing. It's not only uncomfortable to actually play, but even to look at, which I'm sure you've realized by now. Night Force is terrible wasted opportunity, cause with the graphics that it offered and popular at the time side be brawling, it could have been a huge success. And what we've ended up with was a jerky mess that nearly everyone managed to forget 5 minutes after laying their eyes on it first. Last Battle originally came out in the arcades before being ported to numerous home systems, Amiga indirectly being one of them and it's a side-scrolling beat-em-up. As in most games of the kind, your motivation is love, because it makes the world turn and life carry on. Or is it money? Oh well, in this particular case, it is actually love. Because your girlfriend had been kidnapped and held captive by the luckies of a villain of the game going by the name of the Duke. So you polish your horse riding boots, stick your jeans tightly inside them and embark on a mission to save your love, while breaking jaws and throwing punches all around. A quote comes to mind, I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum. And that's not from Duke Nukem. I wonder how many of you know where it's from. Anyway, you're suited up, your biceps are oiled up and you're ready to go. So you must traverse numerous levels, punching and kicking through thousands of bodies to eventually defeat Duke's three generals who are behind the kidnapping. Most levels end with a boss, and most of them are straightforward left to right fair. Some require you to find an exit, but there are few and far between. Last Battle on the Amiga is a port from already pretty disappointing port on Sega Genesis. And Amiga's version is even worse. The graphics are below average for 1991, your kick and punch attacks range seems to be much shorter than that of your enemies, animation is not very smooth and the gameplay is just simply put boring and repeatable. If that wasn't enough, only half of the levels of original are present on our home system. And that's even before mentioning sounds and music. Which, surprisingly, are not as bad as the rest of the game. Punches and kicks are appropriately meaty and music, while not great, is okay. But these two are far from enough to save this mistake of a game. So unless you're a beat-em-up nut and have to play them all, avoid Last Battle like a lactose intolerant person avoids milk and cookies. And it's with vigilance, to say the least. I should know. Harley Davidson The Road to Sturgis may have not been the highest scored game upon its release, but it definitely was an unusual one. Well, you need to go to Sturgis from Maine in 10 days for the famous Sturgis Harley Davidson race, and it's not short of a ride, I must add, 
it's not really a racing game per se. It's a mixture of genres and that's what it's so interesting about it. It's partly a game of the road where you need to get from point A to point B avoiding road obstacles and cops. It's also partly a collection of various motorcycle themed mini games that you can partake in in cities where you refuel your bike at and partly a simplistic RPG slash biker simulation. So you have stats of riding, wealth, mechanics, charisma and brawling, between which you redistribute points at start of the game. And while this may look superficial and unnecessary, your choices here actually influence the gameplay quite considerably. High charisma, for instance, may help you talk your way out of a speeding ticket, and so on. In each of the stops you'll be able to upgrade your bike and your gear using money won in the aforementioned events, and it's best to soup up the beast as much as you can so that the other minigames on the way would be easier and in preparation for the Sturges. When playing it for the first time, you may want to partake in all minigames. In subsequent playthroughs, it's best to only attempt those that you're good at, not to waste time and not to miss your destination in 10 days limit. Harley Davidson is not a game that's easy to categorize, but its unusual mixture of genres makes it enjoyable to fire up once in a while and just to try to get a little bit further living your best biker life. I always liked Harley Davidson's graphics, which may not be stunning, but they're nice enough to not take you out of the experience and obviously the main title tune that just rocks. Hawkeye is a bi-directional horizontal scrolling action platformer that was as huge of a hit on C64 as big disappointment it was on the Amiga. Whoa, what a start. I'm Batman. Yes Bruce, your game was better and also an action platformer. Planet Zamox has been invaded by the evil aliens known as Skirkris and they've basically eradicated the native inhabitants. The leftovers hit in the underground caves to survive, to sustain and eventually strike back. And you're in control of titular Hawkeye, a synthetic lifeform created to rid the planet of the alien scourge. So you'll have to complete all 12 levels, fighting of countless enemies which more often than not are thematically weird and feel out of place. You solve simple environmental puzzles by finding their pieces, there's four per each level, and you'll do it in a very 8-bit feeling gameplay loop. You're not defenseless however and have access to four weapons. A basic pistol, that's weak but has unlimited ammo, fast shooting machine gun, powerful laser and devastating rocket launcher. The latter three require ammo so when you run out you're either back to pistol or have to find the refills. Hawkeye's graphics were out of date on arrival. They use very limited and blunt palette and sprites tend to have two free colors each only, which is not something that we expected from 16-bit games. Backgrounds were actually even more disappointing as compared to C64 outing because they lost their parallax layer and are just static, comfortably sitting behind the foreground. Overall Hawkeye looks plain and boring. It's not a bad game however and if you would just moved from an 8-bit machine to Amiga and got to play it, you'd love it. Thus it would be the gameplay loop you were familiar with already in higher resolution and with better sounds. But if it wasn't your first experience with Commodore's 16-bit powerhouse and you played anything else from Amiga's vast gaming library prior to seeing Hawkeye, you'll be disappointed. Highway Hoax is a surprisingly entertaining action-packed shooter racer and it's as simple of an arcade game as they come. All you have to do is to get to the end of the road or each stretch of the road I should say really in one piece and as fast as possible. After each level you can upgrade your car and its weapons by spending money earned while driving. How do you earn it you may wonder? Well if you drive plenty fast and finish a particular section with a good time you'll get this as bonus. Also damaging other cars rewards cash too. So be fast and deadly is what I'm trying to say here. New cars are available too, so while you start in your nondescript and fairly generic one, it can be swapped out for something flashier given you save up enough money. Both ammo and fuel are limited, so you have to make sure to keep them stocked up at all times. You can get extra fuel as pickup star tokens that you find and collect as you race and ammo can be refilled by shooting trucks that often carry it. Not always though, and you're as likely to drive into an oil slick spilling from it instead of an ammo, so there's that. Since Highway Hawks is a game of time, and at a certain speed and skill point you won't be able to drive faster than it's possible within the constraints of the game engine limitations, you can also get extra time for those extra end level money drops. You do so by jumping over scaffolds. They're not everywhere but if you spot one it's worth focusing on jumping over it cause the old timey saying proves once again true, time is money. Highway Hawks graphics are perhaps not great looking for what Amiga was capable of, but they're clean, easy on the eyes and most importantly butter smoothly scrolling and scaling. Sounds disappoint a little, but not enough to detract from this otherwise fun and explosive experience. And if you like arcade games or racing or even shooters, Highway Hawks is well worth tracking down and playing. Insanitified came out in 1987, so the very same year the famous A500 did. 
keep that in mind, because while I may complain a little about it, it's one of the oldest and first Amiga games in existence. So it deserves some leeway. Ok, since that's out of the way, Insanity Fight is a vertically scrolling shooter. It doesn't bore you with story too much, it's not trying to be something it's not, it's a straight up shoot em up and wants you to do just that. Fly and shoot. Until everything is destroyed and in ruin, or until you're killed. One of the two. There's no weapon upgrades as far as I know, though to be quite honest I've managed to complete the first level maybe a few times and you get an extra life every 15,000 points. Clearly not modern shooter showering you with new weapons, bombs, shields and other pickups. You can fly at varying speeds, which you can actually control and that's not a given in a game as old as this one, and shoot. There are quite a few different enemies, some small, some bigger and some gigantic, and while they're different how they look and pattern of their movement, they are for the most part the same within their respective weight classes. Oh, and there are even unmovable installations that you'll need to destroy, like turrets, guns and such. And that's it. No, really. That's the whole game. You fly, you shoot and try to survive, you get the points, then eventually you die and the game ends. And while it could be considered to be too basic to be playable in 2023 or even a year or so after it came out, I think that it's earned its place in Amiga's history and can be a fun challenge against a friend for points in your classic gaming rotation. If you have one, that is. And someone to play against too. That's probably the most important part of it all. Anyway, Insanity Fight is anything but insanity. It's plain in its design, graphics and sounds. Especially the latter to seem uninspired and uninteresting, but it's not a bad game. It's just old and a victim of an early design, when devs didn't know how to properly utilize Amiga's specialized chips yet. Hellraisers is a game of dual identities, kinda like Bruce Wayne, he's a billionaire philanthropist inventor by day and a cross-dresser BDSM loving, leather-wearing vigilante man but at night. I'm Batman. Oh Bruce, I meant BDSM in a good way. He's so touchy-feely these days guys, sorry. Anyway, Hellraisers is just that, Hellraisers, on the title screen. And then throughout the rest of the game it calls itself Liberators, in huge lettering staring directly in your face. So in the end, I've no idea what it is other than the sci-fi side view action shooter. Oh, and let me save you some time, it's really bad. No really, it is. Half of the time you're walking in some kind of a space themed complex, shooting oddly looking bodies like this half minigun half bipedal cow faced monstrosity, turrets and flying thingy magics looking like those balls Luke Skywalker trained his lightsaber skills on, they're weird. And this first main part of the game feels like something made solely to lure 8-bit gamers to buy an Amiga. So it features gigantic colorful sprites, decent animation and plenty of shooting, and positively 8-bit gameplay design of screen flicking, walking and doing not much else. And the second half is this simple and blunt horizontally scrolling shooter. At least you get some upgrades in it, but other than those it's even less interesting than the main game. I mean, there was a time when I used to work in a small company and we designed games for Android and iOS. We only released a few and I don't think any of them are available anymore, but the first one we dropped, and it was a terrible piece of trash I must add, was this space themed shooter called Redneck's Revenge. Now see how we've committed to the title? It was called that and just that. It had a set of levels, different enemies, explosions, upgrades and a very simple loop. It was not a good game but it was still heaps better than this is. So yeah, play it, don't play it, I honestly don't care. Hellraisers may not be the worst obscure game, cause we have Pro Soccer 2190 being just that, but it's definitely one worth being forgotten. Same as the Janosik from the previous video, both are equally pointless. And you can quote me on that. Powder is a sci-fi horizontally scrolling shoot em up that would have been huge if it came out 5 years earlier in 1993 when Amiga was still alive and kicking. Well, at least for another year it was. And not in 1998, when most system users long moved to PCs or PlayStation. In 1998, when there were literally 17 Amiga users left, only 12 of them liked shoot em ups and 9 out of 12 horizontally scrolling ones. So a game to satisfy their hunger had to be excellent. And Powder is not. It's not bad, do not mistake what I'm saying, it's quite good and playable in fact, even if a bit more difficult than I'd like, it's just not great. And good in 1998 was not enough. And that's why we're here talking about it in this very video. Powder features 6 pretty large levels with both mid and end level bosses to beat, dozens of differently looking and behaving enemies, developers boasted on the game cover about their supposed intelligence, but I haven't noticed anything in particular that would suggest that they're smarter than those in most other games. But they're not bad and like I mentioned the game is plenty difficult already, mainly because of how many enemies are at once on the screen and how many bullets they spew each way, often covering more than half of a screen with them. There are no real weapon upgrades to speak of in Powder, instead it's using a system of 5 cyclable weapons, always available at hand's reach. 
or foot's reach, I should say really, as you toggle between them with a spacebar. And you always press your spacebar in Amiga games with your foot. It's a rule, don't look it up, it's true. Anyway, Powder's graphics are interesting, they range from excellent to a little below average when it comes to backgrounds and it's difficult to confidently tell why. Was it a budget constraint, or the fact that it had two graphic artists and one was better than the other, or maybe just lack of development time? We'll never know, but the fact remains that they're a mixed bag. Everything in the foreground though, all sprites are really nice. And for a game that runs on all Amigas with at least one megabyte of RAM, you can't really ask for more. Sounds are okay and the music is surprisingly catchy. I mean there are better and worse tracks, but all of them feel appropriate for the action that's on the screen and fit well. I like Powder. Not enough to consider it the top 10 shooters on the Amiga, but enough not to launch it as a filler between other better games, but as just one of the games. An innocent man was charged for a crime he didn't commit and sentenced to banishment on a prison planet. It's been ravaged by nuclear wars years earlier and is currently used as a holding for the most dangerous prisoners in the galaxy and generally speaking considered unfit for repopulation. You play as said prisoner. Let's call him Kikolas Nage, a long lost cousin of Nicolas Cage. So Kikolas being the captive in a world out to get him, after hearing of a mysterious ship that crash landed somewhere on the surface and indirectly could be used as means of escape, sets off to find 8 parts of said ship's missing escape pod to use them to regain his freedom and leave the barren planet. Prison is an action adventure that looks incredibly and plays like heavily zoomed in flashback with much less combat and considerably more inventory puzzling. It's smart puzzling though, so if you put your mind to it, there'll be no trial and error here, cause all the solutions are rooted in logic. That said, they are not overly difficult, so you should never feel like you're left without an idea of how to progress further. Oh, and save often. Trust me on that one, save often. Now, like I said, combat is not something you'll be partaking in particularly often, so most of the time you'll spend walking around solving puzzles, gathering items and exploring the planet. And most of that you'll be all alone. Prison is a game that despite its title does not keep you locked up, but never really loses that overwhelming feeling of desolation, loneliness that prisoners tend to experience. It's a dark reality that it portrays and a difficult situation for Kikola's Nage to find a way out of. It may not be the fastest and most action-packed game out there, but it's definitely one of the most unique. And with post-apocalyptic themed graphics and decent sound design, it creates an atmosphere unlike any other. I would recommend it to anyone to try it out, but the pace game plays at may not be for those who crave action. At times it can feel snail slow. But if that's not an issue, definitely seek it out and play it. From 1993, everyone who had an Amiga wanted just one thing. A girlfriend. No, not it. A PC. No, also not it. Oh, I know, a faster Amiga. Well, yes, that's technically correct, but also not what I'm on about. Batman went to the toilet and it will be a while, so I have to simulate those dialogues with myself. I don't have anyone else here really to talk to. Anyway, all Amiga gamers wanted Doom. And no Amiga gamers got Doom for quite a few years more. But we started getting games trying to be Doom, or at least simulate the experience as close to it as it was possible on an Amiga that was not hardware capable of using same display techniques PCs were. And among many better ones like the Citadel or Gloom, we've got those that did everything but shine too. And one of those rusty, dirt covered and generally speaking disappointing attempts was 1995's Polish game Project Battlefield. A four-man development team is arguably too small for such a game and yet they've taken upon themselves to try. And they sorta succeed. I mean everything worked, but everything also felt as if it was in 0.7 alpha version rather than retail 1.0. On a plus side, Project Battlefield can be played even on A500 in a sexy looking stamp sized window, with what feels like a handful of pixels at most. Sure, it's not ideal, but it works. Stronger Amigas obviously allowed to run the game in bigger screens, but upon games release, there was no system that could play Project Battlefield in full screen in 50 FPS. Sure, now we can emulate the hell out of Amiga and have it as fast as it could never originally be, but back then it proved only that the game's in house engine was anything but optimized. Still, like I said initially, it ran, and for many gamers that was enough. But as soon as they started playing the game they've no doubt started noticing other little annoyances, like the fact that your character doesn't walk but rather glides, slides or hovers over the ground and there is no visual feedback to any of the shots that you land on the enemies or they do on you either. And in game where HP is very crucial and you spend most of your time shooting and avoiding getting shot yourself, knowing when you hit and when you're hit is fundamental. If you add to it generic looking enemies, very Wolfenstein 3D like 90 degrees only walls and underwhelming gameplay, you'll realize why it's an obscure game. Oh, I forgot about the story. 
You know what, it was as boring as the shooting, so I will ignore it and just jump straight into our next game. The Punisher, everyone's favorite anti-hero. A vigilante, a warrior for the right and just, where law has failed. Also a psychopath who went totally bonkers bent on revenge against all evil after witnessing his whole family killed right in front of his eyes. I mean, he's not the first man but went through the same thing. But Bruce was considerably wealthier and could afford a therapy and tons upon tons of deadly gadgets other than the guns to truly express the depth of his craziness. Would I do the same thing they did? Hard to tell and I'm not keen on learning. But it had to be said that they're both clearly damaged and found a very niche and dangerous way of coping with their grief. Punisher, the game, promises a lot with its torn straight out of comic book cover beautiful title screen, then it over promises even more with a weapon selection before the mission, it all sets mood for an explosive and fun action packed game that will glue the player to the screen for hours, maybe days. But if I had 5 cents for every promise that either failed to deliver or was overhyped I've encountered, I'd had close to 7 dollars now. Or 5 euros, depends where you are. Sure, the overall presentation, so graphics and sounds, at least in my opinion, are pretty good for 1990, and the Operation Wolf like gameplay is an excellent gameplay fit for the brutal and deadly character, but when you launch the game and play it for a little while, you'll realize that it just feels wrong. And it's hard to tell why exactly. The controls leave a lot to be desired, feeling as if they were not made for this game, just adjusted to fit within its constraints. And everything else is so devoid of fluidity and so jerky, it's a pain to watch in motion. It feels like devs got a license to use Frank Castle and $322 to make a game out of it. Cause if that was the budget for it, then it's excellent. But if it was anything more, then it's not great. All that said, arguably speaking, it's still much more of a game than some other obscure games are, as basically everything works here. It just doesn't work the way I would have hoped it would. It's not a bad game per se, but it's definitely not good. And believe it or not, but in less than two months we've completed another full season of obscure Amiga games. 